Good morning, everyone. Um, can we confirm that the recording has started, please? It's now live. Thank, thank you, um, Leanne. That's lovely. Um, right. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the this virtual meeting of Cornwall Council's Neighbourhoods Overview and Scrutiny Committee. Lovely to have you all here with us today. Um, before consideration of today's business, I will outline, outline the protocols for the meeting, if I may. Uh, so today's meeting is being live streamed to the public via Microsoft Teams and is also being recorded. When members are speaking, they may choose to use their video. If the Council's live stream fails during the meeting and we cannot share the proceedings, I will adjourn the meeting so that access can be restored. If the issue cannot be resolved, I will halt the meeting and the remaining business will be concluded at a future date. If a member experiences a technical issue, I will adjourn for a short period to try and re-establish their connection. Members wishing to speak or ask a question should indicate by typing an X in the chat box, please. Um, and as I call members to speak, I'll remind you to switch on your microphone. If for some reason you cannot be heard, the Democratic officer will advise you. Votes will be taken using a roll call procedure and the Democratic officer will read out the recommendation and the name of the proposer and seconder and will then, will then call each committee member's name in turn. You should advise whether you vote in favour or against the recommendation or whether you wish to abstain the vote from the vote. The Democratic officer will then count the votes and advise the result accordingly, i.e. so many number of votes for or those against and those number of abstentions. Where a member has declared a non-registerable interest, a disclosable pecuniary interest or an interest by virtue of any trade union membership in a matter, they must leave the virtual meeting. Their departure will be confirmed and they will be invited to rejoin the meeting at the appropriate time. OK, so thank you for that. So before we start today's business, I'll ask the De Democratic Services Officer to confirm members and officers that are in attendance, please. Thank you, Chairman. Just for the live stream, Joe Heather, Democratic and Governance Officer speaking now. Um, so um, committee members, I'm going back in turn. Please, can you confirm to me your name and your electoral div division, please? So first of all, Councillor Martin Alvey. So Councillor Martin Alvey and I'm Councillor for the Theoc and Plain Place Division. Thank you. Councillor Malcolm Brown. Um, <clears throat> Malcolm Brown, Councillor for um, St Austell Bethel. Thank you. Councillor Nikki Chopak. Councillor Nikki Chopak, Councillor Division for Poundstock. Thank you. Councillor Dominic Fairman. Dominic Fairman, St Tep and St Breward. Thank you. Councillor Pauline Giles. Councillor Pauline Giles, <coughs> Councillor for St Blasey. Thank you. Councillor Fred Greenslade. Fred Greenslade, St Dennis and Nantian. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call Councillor Steve Knightley. I understand he's having some technical issues, so he may not have joined the meeting at present. So Councillor Steve Knightley. No, he's not here at present. He's hoping he'll hopefully be joining us later. Um, next one is Councillor Matt Luke, please. Uh, yeah, Matt Luke, uh, Penwithick and Biscopo Division. Thank you. Also, Councillor Cornelius Olivier. I'm not sure whether you're with us at the moment. I am. I am oh, with you. I came in slightly you. late. I thought Caroline was calling the meeting off when I first came in, but I now realise that she's do, doing the checklist. But I am here and I represent Penzance Central. Many thanks. Um, next is Councillor Carolyn Roll. Yes, good morning, Joe. I'm here and I represent Mullion and Grade Rowan. Thank you. Councillor John Simmons. Yes, good morning, uh, Councillor John Simmons, uh, Penryn East and Moiler. Thank you. Um, Councillor Ian Thomas has given his apologies. Um, Councillor Mike Thomas. Uh, good morning, Joe. Councillor Mike Thomas uh, representing Helston North. Thank you. Thank you. And also Councillor Kevin Towell. Councillor Towell, Newquay Traferis. Many thanks. Now I'm just going to confirm the cabinet members that are present at the meeting today. So we have Councillor Edwina Hannaford with us. She's the portfolio holder for climate change in neighbourhoods. And we also have Councillor Rob Nolan with us, and he is the portfolio holder for environment and public protection. 
I'm also now just going to read out the officers that are also in attendance with us today. Um, so from the Neighbourhoods Directorate, Sophie Hosking is the uh, Strategic Director of Neighbourhoods. She'll be joining the meeting from 11.30 this morning. From Cornwall Fire and Rescue Service, we have Mark Hewitt, who's the Interim Chief Fire Officer. From Neighbourhoods and Prote Public Protection, we have Alan Hampshire. He's the Service Director, Neighbourhoods and Public Protection. We have Mark Luxton. He's the Head of Community Protection, Licensing and Enforcement. We have James Langley. He's the Acting Environmental Protection Manager. And from 11.30 as well, we have Simon Mould and he's the Head of Communities. From Environment Service, we have Peter Marsh. He's the Service Director, Environment. And from Finance, we have Tracy Stepney, the Strategic Finance Manager. We have Ellie Wilcox, the Head of Financial Planning and Insight, who's also a Deputy 151 Officer. We have Melissa Dyer, who's Controls Team Leader. We have Angela Stevens as well, who's Strategic and Sourcing Manager. And lastly, from Democratic Services, we have myself, Joe Heather, Democratic and Governance Officer. I'm supporting the meeting today. And in the background, we have my colleague, Leanne Martin, who's also a Democratic and Governance Officer, and she's our meeting producer today. So over to you again, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's lovely. Um, Cornelius, lovely to have you with us, my darling. I haven't seen you for such a long time, um, but I hope that you're now on the on the road to recovery. Um, can I ask you to switch off your video, my love, please? Unless unless you're speaking, your your microphone is off already. That would be really helpful. Um, colleagues, I've switched off my camera. Um, being kind to you, you don't need to look at my ugly face, but uh, it's more that I'm I'm trying to protect my bandwidth because sometimes it does play me up. So that's why my camera is off, but I am still here. Uh, right. So if we go through the agenda if we may then please. So the first item, item one, is apologies for absence. I think we have apologies from Ian Thomas. Is there anybody else that we have? No, Chairman, just Ian Thomas. Lovely job. And Steve, uh, welcome. To, uh, Steve Knightley has now joined us. That's good to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, right, declarations of interest, item two. Has anybody got any declarations of interest they need to make on any item on this agenda, please? If you just put an X in the box, if you have, that would be great. No, I haven't seen anything. Right, so minutes of the meeting held on the 23rd of July. I will propose those as a true record and Dominic, I hope, will second them. Um, rather than doing a roll call for this, I wonder, could I ask anybody that is not content with them? So anybody that thinks that there's a fault with them or needs to amend them in any way, can you put your hand up or put an X in the box? But that's if you're not content and therefore by default, we'll assume that everybody is. So um, I'm proposing, Dominic, are you happy to second? Happy to second, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, now, does anybody want to put their hands up that they are not content with those minutes? Ch Chairman, is Joe Heather? Could I just intervene? Yes, um, of course. apologies. I know we're trying to save some time, but we do we do need to actually go through the roll call just oh, for okay, transparency okay. to the public. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, I'm to save your voice. Yeah. I know. Okay, so. Roll call, please. Um, for so we have proposing the minutes. We have Councillor Rule. Seconding them, we have Councillor Fairman. So I'm just going to call your names in order again, um, councillors. And if you can tell me whether you vote in favour against or whether you're abstaining. So Councillor Martin Alvey. Four. Councillor Malcolm Brown. Four. Councillor Nikki Chopak. Four. Councillor Dominic Fairman. Four. Councillor Pauline Giles. Four. Councillor Fred Greenslade. Four. Councillor Steve Knightley. Councillor Knightley, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Um, I was answering my phone at the same time, multitasking. Do you vote in favour in favour against or are you staining from the um the minutes being approved and signed by the chairman? No, I'm happy with the minutes. Thank you. Councillor Matt Luke. Four. Councillor Cornelius Olivier. I, I'll abstain um, as I wasn't present at the last meeting. Could I just ask in passing, when we speak, are we supposed to um, turn our videos on or do we keep them off throughout the whole meeting? I, I miss that. When you speak, Councillor Olivier, if you, you're more than welcome to put your video camera on. Oh, that's good. I brush my hair especially. Right. Then, okay. the, public, then the public can see your newly brushed hair. Right. OK, Thank then. You. Thank you for that. Thank you. So Councillor Carolyn Rule. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And I'm in favour. Thank you. Councillor John Simmons. Yes, four. Councillor Mike Thomas. Four. And Councillor Kevin Towell. 
Yes, four. Thank you. So, um, Chairman, that's that's 13 votes in favour and um, one abstention. <coughs> so the minutes have been carried. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much for that. And thanks, uh, colleagues. Uh, right, we now move on to item four, which is public questions. I believe there are none, but I will double check with Joe if I may. Yes, just to confirm there are no public questions. Thank you very much. Lovely job. So we now move on to pre-decision scrutiny policy development. Uh, item five on the agenda, which is the clean air for Cornwall strategy. Um, and I'm planning to have a break after this, just a small break in, in case you want to know when we're going to be stopping for, for those. Um, so James Langley, I think, is going to take us through this one. James, can I hand over to you, my love, please? Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'm just bringing up my presentation now. Lovely. You want to share your screen, I think, don't you? Yeah, sorry, that's the wrong one. Apologies. Colleagues, what we'll do is we'll, we'll, with the presentation, we'll let them go right through the presentation on each item throughout the, the morning. Um, and if you can remember what questions you have, and we'll bring in questions at the end of the presentations, if that's okay. So just while James is getting his set up a minute. Can I just check everyone? That's fine now, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, lovely. So yeah, uh, thank you committee and thank you for having us here. Um, I'm here to talk about the clean air for Cornwall strategy, which we want to put in front of you. Um, uh, an introduction really into clean air, as you will see, would have seen in your packs. Um, clean air is obviously a, a big public health uh, issue across the country. Um, it's estimated that um, 221 people uh, in four more year um, die prematurely because of poor air quality. Um, we've got at present we've got nine air quality management areas in Cornwall, um, and they're all declared due to traffic-related nitrogen dioxide. Um, and Cornwall has a higher percentage of, of diesel cars when compared to other parts of the country. Um, and uh, that's around 10 years old. So uh, it's usually, I think the national average is around seven. Um, so this strategy is basically a revision of the 2017 strategy. It is a refresh, um, um, so it's not a completely new strategy, but it does, it does, um, it, but it is bringing it into line with various things that have happened over the last few years. Uh, firstly, the climate change emergency, and the Cornwall Carbon Neutral Ambitions for 2030. Uh, uh, government uh, National a uh, Clean Air Strategy, which has been produced in 2019. Uh, and um, parts of the strategy now include um, parts around domestic fuel use, indoor air quality and green infrastructure, which all play a part in um, managing uh, um, and um, issues around air quality. Um, uh, and it's also a Cornwall Council priority uh, help with healthier and safe communities. Um, I just wanted to just run over. Obviously, um, COVID has, has been a massive uh, has had a massive impact on us all, and and uh, just want to put that in context of air quality. So, with regards to traffic flows in Truro, as an example, during lockdown we saw a 55% uh, reduction in in traffic flows. Um, and uh, our continuous monitors that we have in Truro that, that monitor uh, NO2 uh, did fall within that period. So, um, so that 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 is obviously tied in with the reduction in traffic. Um, some travel centres requested trial restrictions to traffic. Uh, see, some um, organisations have changed the way they're operating now. And uh, we're, a lot of us, including the council, are working from home, but that, I, I think a lot of organisations are continuing to do that now. So that's obviously uh, stopping commuter miles. Uh, and uh, obviously there, there has been a modal shift uh, with regards to using this technology, which has um, is created a less reliance on having to move between buildings and office spaces. Um, we uh, we consulted on this strategy. We brought it to NOSC before um, in November, I think, last year, and uh, we went out to consultation. It was a 12-week public consultation, which was uh, um, uh, done in, uh, with the Comms and Engagements team. Um, 185 responses were received on the refreshed um, strategy. Um, 
the with regards to the results, there was a, a, a general agreement that the clear effort yeah. Cornwall strategy considers the key issues for Cornwall. However, there was some disagreement that the measures outlined are suitable and, effect, and effective. But when we uh, looked at the consultation responses, a lot of the information was in, in the strategy or with, um, anyway, but hadn't been brought forward. Uh, and so we've tweaked the, st the strategy that we've brought before you today. Um, it has those tweaks in and has brought those issues forward. So I just wanted to run through some achievements that we, 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 we've had. Um, just uh, just of note, really, the main ones really are the existing AQMAs. Three of these showed no exceedances in 2019 of the UK mean objective. And those towns are Bodmin, Camelford and St Austell. Um, obviously, that's very positive, positive news. Um, but we obviously need more monitoring data to confirm that before we can look at them in terms of their status as air quality management areas but very positive news. Um, we've got clear and robust planning procedures in place now. Uh, Chief Officer's planning advice note was produced uh, for air quality. Um, transport policies and infrastructure um, uh, work has been done to reduce, uh, which is now focusing on reducing car use for short trips uh, and including more rail seats to journey. I believe the trains are now running or were running before pre-COVID uh, every 30 minutes. Um, Active travel plans embedded into the program process, the 205 uh, now electric public electric charging points installed across Cornwall. There was a 23.5 million pound um, uh, grant for the uh, four year bus fares pilot. pilot. Um, significant investments have been made in walking and cycling improvements uh, and um, there was an eight year contract uh, awarded to operate council supported local buses, um, which are low emissions. Um, planning and transport, we, we have a joined up um, spatial and planning uh, a transport strategy and that would be the most effective thing at improving air quality. Again, I mentioned the Chief Planning Officer's note, but we are also working on another document with our planning colleagues uh, looking at mitigation guidance. Uh, so when developments are brought forward through development, uh, some level of mitigation can be put into that development to um, prevent air, uh, air quality issues or a contribution can be made. Um, good quality planning applications should, uh, have regard to all of these uh, great things like active travel, uh, effective green infrastructure, uh, should consider walking and cycling and, and connectivity of, of neighbourhoods and, and workplaces uh, and travel plans for significant themes. Uh, another document that's in draft form at the moment, but obviously will have a, a, an impact on, on improving air quality is the Climate Emergency Development Plan. Um, this will channel funding towards clean growth and accessibility uh, uh, and uh, pr uh, promote active travel and not, not the use of cars. Uh, it will change the way that uh, the Cornwall Council staff and services work by reducing our office estate and promoting working from home. Uh, there will also be some uh, use of Section 106 and SIL funds to focus on mitigation around cl uh, climate change things, which will obviously feed into the work we're doing on our mitigation plan. Uh, and, and we'll re re revitalise our town centres into vibrant community hubs uh, and provide walking and cycling infrastructure. So what, what are we doing? Um, uh, procurement uh, around a thousand vehicles in our fleet. Um, Cormac uh, have set a target for 10% of the fleet to be alternative fuel by 2023, but uh, there is a carbon uh, neutral action plan. We want 100% of low emission vehicles by 2030. So that would be a, a very positive step forward. Uh, investig uh, investigating alternative fuels, there's a biomethane pilot project going on for larger vehicles. Um, Cornwall Council travel plan, you, you know, use of virtual technologies, as I discussed before, working from home. Um, and uh, obviously we've, you know, it's, it, over lockdown, 80% of staff work from home, where, which could have saved up to 42,000 daily commuter miles. Um, uh, and then obviously implementing the carbon neutral action plan. So, what, what can residents and, and, and the general people do to improve air quality? Uh, well, around 40% of, uh, of, of um, pollution uh, comes from diesel cars. So if we can uh, um, get away from our reliance on using diesel vehicles uh, and um, get you know, walking, cycling, 
what have you, we can reduce the amount of nitrogen dioxide. Uh, there's also things, yeah, interesting fact here, car drivers can be exposed to twice as much air pollution as pedestrians, nine times as much as a cyclist uh, on busy routes. Uh, and when you avoid uh, walking along the busiest roads, choose ways uh, choose ways to get to your destination using the quiet streets or trips or parks or other green spaces in traditionalised areas. And that's reflected in our green infrastructure plans and, uh, and, and, and will be infrastructure in planning decisions. OK, so I uh, just wanted to quickly run through our, our, our six, uh, what we think successful look like. We certainly think in the period of the strategy, we'd like to stand down some AQMAs. And um, we feel that the, the trend in, 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 in NOx is reducing in, in many areas. And, and we think in, in a few years time, we'll, we'll be able to stand down some of those AQMAs. Uh, Behaviour change um, uh, and reduce the cars for short distance trip, increase active travel choices, um, introduce a mobility as a service, a single transport car to make it easier to move around, ensure communities are aware of their impact and how they can change. Uh, um, work with businesses to reduce their impacts, look at taxi licensing to ensure better engine technology is being used in taxis, uh, ensuring core quality point planning applications uh, are submitted and, and, and the relevant mitigations uh, presented, uh, call back fleet as I discussed, uh, and, the, and the travel plan and more use of public transport and an uptake of ultra low emission vehicles. So I would like to um, I open up to questions now. Um, I'd like, if you see on the screen there, there are some sort of things you might want to consider, but um, um, uh, but uh, we have a, obviously then have a recommendation to the cabinet uh, that it be approved after we've had those um, questions. Okay, Madam Chairman, thanks very much. Thank you, thank you, James. I wonder, could you leave your the slide up if you don't mind? That would be really good. Yeah, um, no. Colleagues, if you put an X in the box, that would be really helpful um, if you want to speak. And Pauline, I noticed you put your hand up, but that's OK, I've seen you. So Pauline Giles first, please. Oh, yes, thank you for that, uh, James. I I'm just interested to to understand um, how car drivers are, are uh, subjected to more pollutants than cyclists and, and walkers, because at the end of the day, somebody is in the car, whereas if you're out, you're just breathing it in every car that goes past, aren't you? Yeah, I mean, within, within the yeah, yeah, within the yeah, we, we, you recirculate the air within the car, and obviously you're in within the traffic. It will be be taken in through your uh, air intakes, and obviously that that pollution will then get recycled within the car. So that that's where that comes from. I think there's some there's some, some, some scientific data on that. We could probably share with you if you want it. So would should we be um, advocating people having this turning it off and using it as a recycled air rather than? And having their their grills all open. Um, yeah, I mean to be honest, uh, where we have really poor pollution issues uh, is is mainly in very small pockets of, of Cornwall. Uh, generally, uh, uh, clean air, the, the air in Cornwall is pretty clear. Um, but obviously, if you're stuck in traffic, you know, obviously, yeah, st yeah, you just st things like if you've got a more modern cars that use stop start technology and things like that uh, to reduce yeah. that impact and don't idle for too long. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Pauline. Um, next one, please, is uh, Cornelius. Lovely to have you with us, darling. We can see your nice hair now. Cornelius <laughs> Olivier. Okay, just coming, just coming, Chair. Um, thank you <laughs> thank very you. much. I, I have a few questions, obviously pent up questions after a substantial period no, of absence from this committee. <laughs> but um, first of all, I mean, I, I wanted to say, I, you know, a few weeks ago, there was, there was a talk about getting back to normal get back to how it was before the pandemic. And I think that would be an, all, an enormous failure yes. if we did that. If working two days a week, say from home, becomes standard for, for staff who, who are based at County Hall, I think that would be a very good thing. And it's not just the reduction in pollution emissions. You have to look at, uh, I, I put in a question um, some time ago um, about um, what our travel costs were, you know, staff and councillor travel costs. We spend 3.8 million a year on travel costs, recompensing mileage and public transport costs. So a, redu a substantial reduction in that would be very welcome. I also wanted to, the, the other two points I wanted to raise were, I think this Cormac initiative about vehicles powered by alternative fuels is, is brilliant. But I think it's contradictory almost to the point of hypocrisy if we're promoting alternative fuel for Cormac vehicles, but we still have a large free car park at County Hall 
and the park and rides um, subsidise and run by Cornwall Council, not actually used um, very much by county hall staff or councillors. So I think that's something that needs to be addressed, not just for the impact it will have on, on traffic in Truro, but as a sign of this council giving a lead, we should not be maintaining a large free car park at County Hall at the same time as we've got park and rides, which are not used much by council staff or council members. Um, so that, that was the second point I wanted to make. And the third was about the bus. I mean, it's the, the bus subsidy that we obtained from the government to produce such affordable fares in Cornwall was a great piece of work by the council and it was very good news. It's very disappointing that its introduction has been delayed. And is there any indication as to when we will actually be able to introduce it? Because in terms of getting people off, um, the, you know, giving people to a reason to travel by public transport and getting them out of cars, I think it's a very important um, factor in the clean air strategy. So when are we going to be able to um, bring it in after all, as we were, you know, as we were intending to do this um, this September. And the final point is on buses. I've picked up some information which may be incorrect that the the bus pass system that used to be, exist for Truro and Penwith college students, whereby their bus pass didn't just cover their journey, their return journey to college, but covered um, the bus services more generally. Um, has has ceased, which is a really big step backwards, I would say. So, um, have, can you give me any information on that? Right. Sorry for the length of that, um, Carolyn. But, okay, um, um, I'm not sure whether all of those questions can actually be answered by James because several of them seem more transport orientated. But I'll come to James and see how many of them you can you can cover for us, please, James yeah, Langley. Fair enough. Yeah. Regards, regards to the bus. Uh, things I can get back to you on that. I'll obviously speak to the relevant department. We, 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 we noted that down. Um, just to go back on the uh, what you were talking about in terms of um, uh, council staff moving around. The, the council travel plan is is, is in currently being refreshed to to consider that exactly that in terms of um, you know uh, you know not all driving into a particular office. You know and 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 all you know working from home and alternative ways of getting into offices. Um, and obviously that will that that will form part of that, and also part of uh, the council being an exemplar, um, at, you know, at, in terms of green issues, not just air quality, but um, you know, being carbon neutral, etc. Is that okay? Yeah, I I I simply wanted to ask Carolyn. I mean, we've heard about the travel plan being sort of adjusted or developed or whatever for quite some time now. So when are we expecting its uh, delivery? You know, the actual laid out plan. Yeah, I, I think really, Cornelius, that's going to be one that you need to address to Jeff Brown um, okay. or, or to that scrutiny that covers transport. That's not really specifically us. I know it's been delayed because of the COVID. I mean, we, the, we had that wonderful scheme come through, as you say, that was that was brilliant about um, reducing fares. And then the government was saying, don't use buses, don't use public transport. Yeah, so I know, it's very frustrating. But it, it is amazing and it will come in as soon as they can. But I think Jeff will probably be able to give you a better answer on that one, love, OK? OK, thank you very much. Thank you for your questions. Um, Martin Alvey, next, please. Thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, very interesting report, um, particularly uh, the, the stats around Cornwall's um, vehicle ownership. And I, I think it's long been known that uh, Cornwall is the place that cars come to die. Um, so not a great surprise that our car ownership tends to be older. Um, surprising that uh, our diesel ownership is significantly higher. And so I'm, I'm pleased that we're trying to move towards encouraging people to um, to get newer, greener cars, particularly electric. Um, the 2018 stat for 966 electric vehicles. I'd be interested to know if if there's a more recent um, stat for that to to see um, sort of the, the trajectory trajectory of growth. Um, the point I want to make. Um, possibly in, in form of a question relates to increasing charging points across the county. And the reason I make this point, actually, I was contacted by somebody, not, not a co constituent, but somebody who um, has been coming to Cornwall for many, many years now um, on holiday, uh, came down this summer and they have now got an electric car. Um, and they have actually said that, unfortunately, you know, they won't be coming back to Cornwall for a while because they just didn't feel confident that they 
and were able to charge their car um, whilst they were down here. Um, so there's a range anxiety issue, which I think may start to have an impact on our our visitors as more and more electric cars are owned by visitors. And I'm wondering if in addition to the public charging points that we're promoting, whether there is scope to look into some form of incentive to encourage businesses, particularly um, village um, or rural pubs with car parks, uh, hotels and such like to introduce public charging points or um, points that um, the public can access in addition to their guests. Um, so and um, one final question, I don't know if there is any stats available yet to um, show how the reduce or the um, average speed camera um, enforcement system in Grand Pound has impacted on the uh, em emissions in that particular um, zone. I appreciate that uh, stats will have been um, skewed by the, uh, the change in um, commuting habits um, due to COVID, but I wonder if there is any evidence at all to support um, a reduction in, uh, in emissions um, as a result of that, uh, uh, indirectly as a result of that speed uh, enforcement system. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. Um, in the chat bar, Edwina's put in that there is an app that maps all charging points. Um, so that's really helpful. I think maybe maybe we need to, to sort of publicise that and, and do some comms on that, perhaps. In my response to the individual, I didn't actually copy that, that, that bit of information. Brilliant. That's um, brilliant. But, Thank you. You've already done that. That's good. Yeah. Um, right. So if I come up to James, I wonder, could you answer those points for Martin, please? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Councillor Hannaford and Councillor Alvey, um, for your comments. Um, firstly, I'll start with Grand Pound. It's probably a bit early to tell yet. Um, we tend to look at our data in terms of an annual mean, so it'd be, it'd be interesting to see when we get that data completed, uh, which will be early next year now. Um, the problem is it's got a bit of a, it's a bit skewed with what's going on at the moment with COVID, so there may be a reduction just because there wasn't very much traffic moving along the A390 uh, because of that. But we. But it'd be, it'd be interesting to see it over the next couple of years to see whether that has had an effect or not. Um, the the other question, uh, yeah, um, the other the other thing about uptake of electric vehicles has gone up to over four thousand. Um, um, so and registered in twenty nineteen. Um, the um, other thing about electric vehicles, uh, which obviously when you talk about range anxiety, um, we uh, when we're looking at fleet vehicles and whatever vans, I think before didn't have a very very high range, and I think the battery power in a lot of these vehicles, I'm not a specialist in this area, but is improving. So the kilowatt, you know, in terms of the range, and you can get 120 to about 180 in a small van now. Um, so that, that's obviously going across cars as well. So it, it, obviously, the, the, whilst we're improving the infrastructure, the actual technology of the vehicles themselves is improving. And so that, that will obviously help, um, um, you know, make them more a viable option for people if they need to use electric vehicles. Is that OK? Uh, that, that's fine, really. I just, I just wanted to emphasise that, that uh, there's an there's a economic benefit as well of electric charging points in terms of our um, the tourist um, industry, which obviously is important to the county and the fact that more and more people out of county also own these vehicles and, and um, will need to charge if they come here. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. That's good. Um, just while you're talking about charging points, if I could just get one one clarification, unless I'm reading it wrong, which is which is also quite likely in page on page 15 of the report, um, paragraph 2.25, it says there's 205 public charging points and 66 more planned over the next three years. But in the strategy on page 15 of the strategy, it says it's 115 charging points. And I'm not sure why the difference is there, if, if you could um, Clarify that for me. That would be really helpful. Yeah, two two hundred five is the latest figures. The um, we can amend that obviously before we take it to cabinet. Um, okay, that's, uh, that's fine. Um, that was a, that was in the previous draft that was brought to us, which obviously right, hasn't been. It, it, that, it doesn't make sense otherwise. That's that's good. Thank you, um, Mike Thomas. Next, please. Thank you. I, I was expecting Andrew Long next, but. Uh, 
No, he's but, not a member of the committee, darling, so he comes oh, in afterwards. that's right, he isn't. You're quite right. Sorry, thank you. He's always very patient, bless him. He is very patient, right. James, thank you for uh, your presentation. Good to see you again. Excellent graphics, really good to see the detail. And I read the report thoroughly over the weekend. Um, a couple of things come to mind. Um, the 90K for the taxi, um, to, to assist the, the taxis, and you could perhaps say a little bit about, more about that. And whether it be, might be possible through this, if other members felt the same, whether we would have had any effect in lobbying for uh, more of these uh, points around, around calling for taxis. Because I'm of the opinion, and Kevin might be able to have an opinion on this as well, Kevin Tao, Councillor Kevin Tao, I think taxi drivers and taxis themselves are key to uh, to moving forward with air quality. Uh, I would, I personally like to see far more electric vehicles, electric taxi vehicles, and, and taxis encouraged to cross over. But also um, the, the, the fact that they tend to, I'm sure Kevin doesn't, uh, leave their taxis running so they idle in, in outside uh, uh, various buildings and do cause a lot of anxiety to people. So I do think taxis are a way forward. If we could find some way of supporting the taxi business and actually uh, then through them would actually be able to educate the public about how electric vehicles are so useful and popular. That's my one question or observation. The other one is about 5G. I didn't see any, perhaps I missed it, any reference to 5G because I'm aware that through 5G and the rollout of fibre, there is the capacity within our street furniture to actually display data such as the quality of the air. And that would then alert people to the simple fact of how clean or how not so clean the air is in their vicinity. Um, just so, so 5G and uh, taxis based in Sebastopol and I think uh, Bodmin. Yeah, th thank you, Councillor Thomas, for those comments and good to see you again. Um, yeah. Um, Firstly, um, regarding uh, taxis, yeah, there's, there's a few bits going on around taxis um, and obviously uh, um, the first one is we are installing those two taxi uh, points. Uh, one of them uh, is using some of the Section 106 money uh, in the, the CPR area. So we're installing one in Red Ruth Flowerport Carpool up Park, and that's the plan anyway. Uh, and then the other one's going into Bobmin. And um, we're going to try and uh, work with the trade in those areas to see if they can move towards getting a uh, electric vehicle or whatever. They are the rapid charging points. Um, so rather than having fast chargers, which may take a little a bit longer, we, we wanted to put ra rapid ones in there. So, so uh, and they can use one of the car parking spaces in one of our existing car parks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, yeah, the other thing we're doing around taxis is licensing. So we're looking at licensing policies at the moment with regards to engines and whether we can put some curbs on what engines are used in taxis and have a, a maximum age limit. Mm. Uh, so um, and that's sort of we, we're looking at the licensing policies now is, uh, um, in terms of um, you know consultations and what have you. But that's certainly a plan going forward. So improving the uh, engine technology within taxis if they're not electric and obviously educating um, uh, taxi firms to to start taking on electric vehicles. Um, I know in my hometown, Northstall, at the moment, um, there is a there is an electric taxi yeah. company, very successful, and I know they've made big fuel savings. So uh, I'm sure that will be quite um, a big emphasis for taxi operators in terms of cost of fuel and stuff. Well, and it's, successful. It, it wasn't intended to criticism at all of taxi <laughs> drivers or companies. In fact, I think they can do an awful lot of service to us through education, <laughs> like you're describing. Yeah. 5K? 5K? 5G, sorry. 5G, yeah, yeah. I've not seen that myself, so I can get back to you on that. Um, we do, we do, ha we don't have a limited number of, of sort of real-time monitors, but they need to be downloaded. So we haven't got any real-time monitors in terms of, you know, you can see it on a screen or anything at the moment. But certainly, as technology moves on, we can look yeah. at different ways of monitoring our, our AQMA areas. Uh, yeah. But most of it's done using diffusion tubes. So um, yeah. uh, they're sent to the lab and tested uh, after a month being exposed so that it's not very real time. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Um, uh, Chair, Madam Chair, could, could I possibly re reply very quickly to a point made by uh, Councillor Cornelius um, about the issue of uh, park and ride? As uh, Councillor Alvey will also testify, we don't have the luxury of a park and ride that reaches out to Penryn, Falmouth and Helston. Exactly. And uh, unlike uh, the Council Corners, I don't have the luxury of being able to step outside of my division and get onto a train that takes me straight to County Hall. 
And I think there, there should be a recognition that our officers and members live in a rural county, a rural duchy, mm. and it is very difficult to get to Truro without using a private vehicle. I think yeah. car sharing is perhaps the way forward, which we should investigate a great deal further. But the constant vilification of people who you drive cars uh, is not really, I think, always appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Mike. And I'm in the same boat because um, out here I, I've got I've got to drive um, 20 miles to get to get to the train station, and it's 20 26 miles to, to County Hall. So it's uh, it's it would make a nonsense of it. Um, right, thank you for that, my love. Um, now the next one is Dominic Fairman, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, James, for the um, excellent report. Um, so I've got a few quick points, and I'll reel them off. Um, so firstly, I thought it was very striking that nine out of ten of our AQMAs are in the most deprived neighbourhoods, and I wondered if we had a hypothesis around that. Um, secondly, <coughs> I note from BBC News that the, the government's own air quality expert group says that particles from um, brake wear, tyre wear and road surface wear directly contribute to well over half of particle pollution from road trucks. So uh, over half, I wonder why there's no mention of this in our strategy. Um, the three million we get out of the 500 million clean air fund, um, I would like your honest opinion of whether you consider that's a fair funding for Cornwall or whether we're being shortchanged there. Um, there's brief reference to the council's group of businesses, but no particular mention of the airport. And I wonder if we feel that the um, emissions from airplane either affect our air quality or we should be holding our hands up to them. And then finally, um, the rollout of electric cars, which is going to be compulsory by 2040 as government policy. Um, when it was muted that it was come down to 2035, the Society of Motor Manufacturers did some work and they estimated at the time that we'd need to be installing 500 electric charging points a day between now and 2035. Um, that would be five a day in Cornwall. So given I know it's 2040 is the actual target, but it would seem to me that the ambition of um, rolling out 66 more over the next three years is way, way, way below what is going to be needed um, to practically make uh, that, the, you know, the phasing out of diesel and electric by 2040 a practical um, solution for everybody. So um, that, that's my five points. I'm sorry so many. Um, I hope you can address as many as you can. Uh, th th thank you, Councillor Fairman. Um, I'll just, um, you know, in regards to the brake wear, um, yeah, obviously that's, uh, we do monitor for particulate matter, which is basically what, what, what the sort of brake wear materials are. Um, we've got no exceedances anywhere we monitor at the moment, so we haven't declared any of our AQMAs on that. So it's not at the moment a massive problem. Um, the government emphasis uh, going forward is to look at smaller particle matter, so PM 2.5. Um, we're not uh, monitoring for that at the moment because there is no requirement to do so, but we may there may become a limit in the next few years, so we might need to consider that. So it will be looked at. But at the moment, particulate matter, PM 10, is, is not exceeded anywhere in Cornwall um, um, for air quality. So it's an interesting point. Um, the um, the uh, Clean Air for Cornwall Fund, in terms of um, uh, it being fair, um, it, yeah, I mean, the, the Clean Air Zone money, um, three million pounds is, is quite a limited amount to do anything drastic. Obviously, we can fund uh, behavioural change uh, campaigns, but obviously there's a lot of local authorities competing for that money. And I don't think personally, if, if you want, I want opinion from me, I think probably you could, we, we need more if we're going to address these issues. Um, with regards to um, um, electric cars going forward, um, I, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Um, uh, I'll speak to uh, our, our, our sort of EV infrastructure team and get some more information to you on that if that's okay because I haven't got that, that information in front of me. Um, and uh, I think was that, that, was that the last one. I, just having a look, yeah. I was wondering about um, why so many. Uh, or the AQMAs are in deprived neighbourhoods. Yeah, that, that's an interesting one, actually. Um, uh, this is more, again, my opinion and not, not any sort of scientific basis for that, but the, you've probably got older cars in those areas because people have obviously got less money. 
Uh, you tend to have smaller, more terraced properties, which are closer to the road, for example, Camborne and, and places like that, uh, which cause these air quality issues. So that, th those are probably the reasons and people, you know, this, the, that's probably the two main reasons, in my opinion. Is that, is that OK, Councillor Fairman? Yep, that's fine. Just briefly um, on the airport, are, are we holding our hands up for the emissions from aeroplanes or um, are we only looking at the airport operation? I uh, it would probably be more the airport operations and traffic to and from. We're looking at local air quality pol uh, pollution, so that's really by the roadside mainly, uh, mm -hmm. towns and cities. So, um, well, uh, so yeah, we probably wouldn't look at it from the actual aircraft, but uh, like I say, traffic to and from into Newquay and things like that could be considered, you know, going forward if um, it, as as Newquay develops as a town. Okay, thank you. That's okay. fine. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dominic, and thank you, James, for the for the responses there. Um, Malcolm Brown next. Um, thank you very much. Um, firstly, um, I was interested in the comment about possibly standing down some air quality management areas. I would not support that. I think that would be highly premature and I think it would give totally the wrong messages to members of the public that we that we've solved a problem which is still continuing. Um, I'm saying that because um, I represent St Austell and part of Holmbush which is the key site in St Austell is in my division and I'd if you ask residents there if they think air quality is stabilizing or getting better they would think we were mad it's it's not that long ago that the council got a lot of publicity for saying houses there might even have to be demolished you know to deal with the air quality problem so i find that bit of the report very, that remark very strange it doesn't seem to be in the report unless i missed it but i would i would hope we'd be very cautious and if there's any thought about getting rid of any of these air quality uh, management areas, local members would be fully involved. Um, um, secondly, um, <clears throat> certainly for people of my age, and I'm, I hate having to say that now, but I think um, all the initiatives about cycling and walking are great, but, but you're not going to get 80 year olds cycling and you're not going to get 80 year olds walking very far, but you can, but you, we can get more 80 year olds onto buses and the public transport references seem to be mainly about the the um, modernity of the vehicles and the the emissions from the vehicles. But I think that's all great, but you've got to have routes operating that people can get on them. And, um, you know, I, I do hope we can we can make a bit more of that. Um, the other point I, I just I just cannot resist making is that um, with all the discussion in this report about officers working from home and um, you know access to council buildings, I do hope members of this committee are going to be champions as, as the debate continues for the importance of trying to minimise um, travel by and for council purposes. Um, you know, I think there are many advantages of the way that we're working and, um, you know, I think some members of the council have just got this badly wrong. And James, yes. can you, do you yes. come back? Thank you, Councillor Brown, for, for your comments. Um, yeah, talking about the standing down of AQMAs, um, obviously that, that will be done in full consultation like we did with the AQMA um, uh, action um, plans originally when they were produced for St Austell. We are seeing a drop in, in Knox, uh, Knox. So whilst the amount of traffic, I don't know, I haven't got any traffic details for particular places, but the traffic may remain the same, but as engines improve and um, people uh, make choices around newer vehicles and electric vehicles, obviously that will, will drive down the, the, the local pollution. Obviously, domestic fuel as well. There's there's work going on around that as well. So any houses which may have old coal fired um, uh, uh, heating systems and things like that, um, that you know we, we're moving away from sort of uh, smoke smoky sort of old coal. There'll be more regulations coming out around around that, and um, and uh, sort of use of very dry wood if you've got log burners and stuff, and that also will also improve air quality in those areas. 
Um, but obviously we would not stand down AQMA, certainly just on one year's worth of data. Uh, I would even say that we'd have to be very, very careful about using this year's data because of what's happened with COVID. So I think it would have to be uh, a few years of monitoring before we even um, think about standing down. But it is, but it is an ambition because basically that means we have been dealing with the problem and the problem is going away and it's an acknowledgement to the government that you know the, the problem is being dealt with so that is the ambition uh, to come back with regards to cycling infrastructure completely agree you know it's not it's not going to be for everyone and i think it's important uh, that you know with whilst buses are low emissions they are connected and there's good services they're connected to other forms of transport like the, the trains and what have you and it's easy to get on and off like the, so for example a single travel card etc uh, and uh, and obviously there's the bus fares pilot which obviously um, um, will, will come in at some point with the, with the 23.5 million pounds investment uh, so does that, does that answer your question then uh, um, councillor brown yeah, that, yeah, that's um, that's very fair, and you you were very sensible to dodge my last point. Sorry, what was that? The last point was about um, access to council offices by um, officers and and um, um, councillors. It was a mischievous point, James. Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> the chairman knows me too well. <laughs> uh, right then, um, Cornelius. I know you've indicated, but you've already asked some questions. So I'm going to go down through the list and come back to you if I have time. Um, so the next person is Kevin Towell, please. Yeah, thank you for that, chair. Yeah, thank you, chair. Uh, yeah, um, I'm not sure if these these are the items I need to declare an interest on, but they're, they're more observational. Nothing, there's nothing in, in detail, so they're observational. So I don't I don't think that it's anything I need to declare. But I, I do own an electric car and uh, I tra travel around Cornwall quite regularly. Uh, I do find that there are, there are actually plenty of charging sites within the county. Um, but what may be an issue soon uh, as the use of electric cars increase is capacity. Uh, often with these char charges, it's one car at a time. So, you know, we soon may end up in a situation when we're, we're queuing to use them. That's not happening yet. And I don't think I can remember a time so far that I've had to wait for another car to finish. I'm just driving and charge up and I'm away. So that, that's working fine at the moment, but I think it's going to be an issue very soon. Um, secondly, I think it was uh, Councillor Thomas who raised the taxis. Um, I have a taxi. Uh, it's not the electric car, it's a diesel, uh, but there are more and more electric cars coming on, electric taxis coming online. And I think that's got a lot to do with their own individual business model. So if you're a private hire, it's a lot easier to plan your your day and your route and you know how much battery usage you're going to be uh, using. It's a lot harder to do that if you're uh, on a taxi rank driving a hackney carriage car. Customer gets in and says either I want to go around the corner or I want to go to um, Plymouth or Exeter Airport, you know, then then that's a different ball game, which obviously will cause an issue for electric cars. So I think it's down to the individuals and their own business model. Uh, Councillor Thomas also raised a good point about idling, and I think that is an educational matter because it's not just the air quality, it's the noise, the disturbance that parking outside somebody's house and keeping your engine running for five or ten minutes and that, that happens regularly that can cause a disturbance as well as harm in the air, air quality as well. So I think that's something we uh, we need to look at. So th thank you, those are, those are my observations. Thank uh, you Kevin. Sorry. No, sorry James. Um, yeah, just, just thank you for your comments. Um, 
Uh, regards to charging points, obviously, yeah, that's that's quite an interesting one. Um, I'd probably have to go back to our UV structure um, uh, colleagues on that one. But um, just a personal point of view, I think as range increases, we may not have the, the need to keep stopping and charging at places that aren't at the home. So, you know, if we've got ranges of you know, 150, 200 miles on cars now, it's probably, you know, the, the point where we have to actually charge up locally or hopefully um, move away from that. But um, yeah, that, that's just a personal opinion of mine. Uh, we've got uh, interesting points around uh, the taxi and uh, taxi private hire. Obviously, yes, you're right. You can you can plan your journeys a bit more, but obviously uh, Hackney's already a, a lot different. But obviously, there are alternatives to an electric at the moment uh, with, with 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 the poorer ranges. So you know they might want to consider rather than using a diesel, they might want to use a, a diesel, um, sorry, a, a, a petrol hybrid or something like that as an interim measure uh, would be better than using a, a, an older diesel, uh, you know, an older diesel. So that's my comments on that one. Uh, and idling, just to pick up on that, there has been some signs put up in in some towns in Cornwall regarding idling. I think one of them being Camelford as an example. So uh, idling is, is obviously something we would like to tackle going forward as well. Thank you, James and, and Kevin for your question. Um, Matt Luke, next, please. OK, yeah. um, yes, with with the taxi thing, um, I, I almost have found it laughable to a certain thing with some of the comments um, that were made there as the company in St Alston have been promoting the electric thing for years and years and years and quite frankly have been hindered by Cornwall Council more than they've been helped um, and I know that through through dealing with them myself so all of a sudden uh, it, it's like the thing to do whereas like five minutes ago they were being hindered at every opportunity so I'll leave it at that and say we should be looking at that as an example as to how to promote it in other areas and be asking them how they did it and what the foot what the um you know footfalls and everything were of, of doing it um the other thing is i agree with malcolm about um not bringing down the areas uh you know for <laughs> built up areas and, and the and the range there and also the biggest worry is with planning if certain papers go through in the future or everything that we've done in, in this this paper about planning will go out the window because we'll have no control over it and that will be the end of that so how how do we how do we combat that in the future if this new paper goes through um, and what help can we give to other companies out there in promoting say electric vehicles and so forth and also if we've got all this land that's now not going to be used at council offices all over the country because we're not using cars and supposedly using public transport we could be put electric stations in there at council offices and and air um other buildings throughout the um cornwall um so that's something to think about possibly okay thank, thank you councillor Luke, for your comments there um yeah, I, I wasn't aware of any. Uh, I've not been involved with regards to the um, the council, um, the taxi company you you talk about in terms of its hindrance. But obviously, well, I feel they they are an exemplar in terms of uh, the use of uh, the taxis around the town of St Austell, and um, I fully, from an air quality point of view, fully support support what they're doing. Um, uh, and obviously, I, I, I touched on the AQMAs when I answered um, um, Councillor Brown's question, uh, uh, and obviously the, the work we would do around that. Obviously, we're just general planning policy it, it is moving forward with regards to you know in, ensuring that 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 uh, developments are um, you know greener and cleaner, and will have the mitigations, charging points, things like that, in terms of um, you know controlling. Uh, air quality. So we, we would hope that the, 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 the policies going forward, even if they're not in an AQMA, would uh, protect air quality in, in towns and cities. Thank you for that. Um, Andrew Long, can I bring you in next? Thank you for your patience. You're very welcome. Anything for you. Oh darling, um, you are kind. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to, to uh, ask a couple of questions. First of all, I would totally support what Councillor Brown has said about the need not to reduce the amount of air quality management areas. 
Um, not everyone lives in, in uh, close to a train station or close to a really good bus service to allow people to get to, to Truro. Um, some of us who live in the Far East, we suffer from um, different issues with regard to that, with regard to transport getting places. But the real concern I have is that we don't don't seem to as a council to be addressing the issue of the crossing points across the Tamar. Um, and over the last two months, no fewer than five days, we've had issues where massive traffic jams have ensued due to accidents or incidents either side of the Tamar, either on the A30 or the A38, which have caused total chaos. Um, those of you who live in the Mid and West of Cornwall might not realise what chaos it, it can ensue, but people having to queue for two and a half hours to get to 10 miles is really, really difficult and it has a massive pollution impact. The people on the A319 in Gunners Lake and St Anne's Chapel have suffered for years from poor air quality because of the geography and because we have singularly failed to deal with pollution from traffic in that area and the A390 still is the, the major route that um, the highways are telling people to use if the A30 and the A38 are stuck, are closed. And the road cannot, literally cannot take it. And anybody who, who knows the crossing points, it's not like creating a little bypass like um, you, do, you can do in the West. There's a big river in the way to stop people traversing across the border into England. And we need to be looking at that whilst we want to encourage people out of public, out of private cars and diesel cars in particular, um, we need a reality check in the fact that at the present time we need to be working really hard on, on looking at a long term solution for the crossing points, increasing the public transport, in, in, especially in the east where we have a more rural dispersed population. But I think the, the real issue is let's not avoid, let's not take away some of these air management areas, but let's actually do something with it. Well, at the moment we're recording information left, right and centre, but it doesn't seem to be anything we're actually doing to solve the problem. So it's really just a call that we should be looking at how we deal with the crossing point, the crossing points, um, because we have to deal with Devon, Plymouth um, and North Devon as well. And we need to find long term solutions whilst we go to electric cars. Brilliant. And I'm getting much that will hopefully be my next vehicle I get. But until that point, we do have there'll be lorries, there'll be bus, some buses um, which are really big pollutants, but we need to provide ease of access because vehicles parked or vehicles stood still with their engines running really do pollute the local environment. So I'd like to hear that we're actually starting to look at that. Thank you. Yeah, I, whilst I'm not sitting on the transport side, um, uh, I, we are linking quite a lot with transport now. Um, we, we, we are meeting on a regular basis and we will be looking at these issues. I can't um, talk about um, the crossing points in any detail because I, I've not got any um, sort of information on that and that is in my area. But obviously, um, you know, we, we would like to improve the air quality uh, by ensuring that, the, you know, the, the, the transport links in that area are right. But also, I think with those major trunk roads in the east as well, we want to encourage people not to be driving to Plymouth if they, you know, and to jump on the train if they possibly can or at least drive to their nearest train station and you know go into Plymouth to, to stop um, you know the clog up of traffic uh, you know along those major arterial routes uh, so that's my sort of comments on that really. Okay. With, with respect I think I think the error in what you've just said is right at the start when you said that's not really in your area it really needs to be because I don't, you need to, either that or we need officers to, when this pandemic is over, is to spend way more time up in the east of Cornwall and looking at the situation. Um, getting somebody to get on a train is easy if you live in a town or near a town which has a train station, but there are massive areas of northern and eastern, northeast Cornwall that have no, nowhere near a train station. So it's, we've got to look at alternative issues as well. Yes, encourage people into electric cars, and I think that's really, really important. But we also need to make sure that when they're in their electric cars, they're not still stuck sitting in traffic, because otherwise they, that does not solve the issue. In the long term, we need to make sure that crossing 
the Tamar, whether it's in the south, the mid or the northern part of the border crossings, need to be taken into account and we need really need some work to be done on that. So um, it's a plea really to say, let us remember that Cornwall covers all the way up to the east and that border crossing is vitally important for everybody because a lot of materials both come into Cornwall and more importantly, we export to elsewhere in the UK and abroad across those major arterial routes. We need them to be kept as clear as possible. Thanks, and thanks, Andrew. Um, Cornelius, um, to come back to you, um, are you very brief? Because I'm, we're running out of time. So can you be very succinct in what you want to say? What is it you're you wanting to ask now? Well, I'm, I'm always striving to be succinct. Right? I just, I just want, I just wanted to not always successfully. I confess, as I'm just displaying. <laughs> I but, to say that. Yes, but I think the point. I, electric vehicles are great, but I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that for decades to come. Um, we're going to be dependent in Cornwall on hundreds of thousands of older, more polluting cars. You know, we mustn't lose sight of this, that fact that that's going to be the way it is for some decades to come. In terms of electric cars and tourism, I'd like to recommend the Penzance model, whereby you get the train down, you stay in a budget hotel instead of a, a holiday let, you use the Mounts Bay cycle path, or you get the coast bus along from Land's End to Snives. You know, it is perfectly possible to visit Cornwall without using a car at all. In fact, if if you really you know want to, on the subject of Mal the, the Malcolm raised about um, meetings, um, I certainly don't want us to go back to how we were. But yes, I would prefer this meeting, for example, to take place uh, face to face in public because I actually think that is the most effective way to challenge and scrutinize. You actually have to be in the same room. There are lots of meetings that don't mean to be in the same room, but as soon as we can get back to scrutiny meetings where we're sharing the same space, I think that is the most effective mechanism of scrutiny. Um, and finally, a, a councillor, a member earlier, used the word vilification in re reference to something I said. I, I don't think I was sort of demonising or vilifying anyone. I was simply pointing out, though, that although it may not be practical for quite a lot of staff and councillors to use the park and ride, many people for whom it would be practical are choosing not to do so. Yeah. Uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, sweetheart. I don't think there's a question as such in there, but but some good points as, as always. Um, right, so we're moving now to the recommendation, which is on page eight. And I've had notification that Dominic has got um, some recommendations or uh, um, suggestions. So Dominic, can you share those with us, please? I don't know whether you can share your screen with them or what. which way have you done them? How's that? Is that shared? Yes, it is. Thank you. Well done. OK, so um, um, so I'm disappointed that um, Councillor Olivia thinks that we're not doing proper scrutiny here. I think it's been an excellent debate, mm -hmm. um, but here are my recommendations anyway, and I seek some support for these. Uh, they pick up on some of the earlier points made by councillors. Um, one that the Clean Air of Cornwall Strategy 2025 is approved and endorsed. Uh, two, that the Cabinet robustly lobby for a fairer proportion of the Clean Air Fund in order to help facilitate a more ambitious active travel network at a faster pace. And then thirdly, that the Cabinet recognise that the ambition of installing 66 more charging points over the next three years is an inadequate response to meeting the national policy around the phasing out of new diesel and petrol cars by 2040. So I'll be looking for support or comments on those, please, Chair. Thank you, sweetheart. And you're proposing those, are you? I am. Great. If you just leave that on the screen, that would be really helpful. Um, Malcolm Brown has indicated. Are you willing to second those or do you want to speak to them, love, please? Um, yeah, I, I would be willing to second them if um, Councillor Fairman will also include something in the general first clause about asking um, points made at points made in the debate which um, to be incorporated into the into the draft um, submitted to cabinet. Um, Councillor Fairman himself said that we've had a good debate. It therefore seems that a bit of a waste of our time if we're told we've we've had a good debate, but the points that we've made are not going to be carried forward. So if he will incorporate that, I will second. Thank you. Dominic, can you put some wording in to do that? Yes. Are you willing to? Brilliant. I'll, I'll try and do that on the hoof. 
that's that's brilliant because I, I I think also the point that I made that in the strategy the numbers don't actually add up about the number of points we've got and and James said that that's because they're they need updating so some of the actual strategy needs to be updated before it progresses on I think anyway so that would be really helpful um I, I don't know what the wording would be there hang on. Chairman, it's Joe Heather, the Democratic and Governance Officer. I was just going to suggest, is it something about, I think, yes, I think Dominic's adding it now, subject to exactly what I was going to say. Brilliant. Yeah, That's point, lovely. So the points raised in the minutes, it would actually cancel the firm. And if you could also put in the recording of the meeting as well, because the minutes aren't verbatim. Uh, okay, what recording instead of minutes or? Well, minutes, and, minutes and the recording of the meeting. Brilliant. OK, right. So that's that's proposed by Dominic Fairman and seconded by Man Malcolm Brown. So now we'll go to the vote if we may, please, with a roll call. So can I hand across to you, Joe, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. So I'm just going to confirm then. So the <coughs> recommendation to Cabinet is that the Clean Air for Cornwall Strategy 2020 to 2025 be approved and endorsed, subject to inclusion of points raised in the minutes and the recording of today's committee meeting. That's the first um, recommendation. The second is that the Cabinet robustly lobby for a fairer proportion of the Clean Air Fund in order to help facilitate a more ambitious active travel network at a faster pace. That the Cabinet reckon, and number three, that the Cabinet recognise that the ambition of installing 66 more charging points over the next three years is an in inadequate response to meeting the national policy around the phasing out of new diesel and petrol cars by 2040. So we have Councillor Fairman proposing that, and we also have Councillor Malcolm Brown seconding that proposal. So now, are there any other proposals, or can we take that one to the vote? I'm taking silence. That means that we can take this to the vote. So the vote will be right by roll call again. So um, I'll ask, I will read out your names in turn. Please tell me if you're voting in favour, against, or you're abstaining. So first of all, Councillor Alvey, please. Four. Councillor Malcolm Brown. Four. Councillor Nikki Chopak. Four. Councillor Dominic Fairman. Four. Councillor Pauline Giles. Four. Councillor Fred Greenslade. Four. Councillor Steve Knightley. Four. Councillor Matt Luke. Four. Councillor Cornelius, Councillor Cornelius Olivier. Yeah, thank you for getting my name right. Not every member of the council manages to. The uh, four. Mm. Thank you. Councillor Carolyn Rule. Four. Councillor John Simmons. Four. Mike Thomas. Four, and I apologise to Councillor Olivier for getting his name wrong. I don't mind a bit. I don't mind a bit. Thank you. And lastly, Councillor Kevin Tao. Four. Okay. So thank you. So we, our committee at the moment, um, we do have one vacancy. So our full committee is 14 committee members. We have one apology today. So um, our votes are all going to be out of 13. So I have, Chairman, I have 13 votes in favour. So the motion is is um, passed. Chairman, you, sorry, do you, did you want to clarify about the previous vote as well? Yes, I would like to. So members, I previously, um, when I read out the vote for the minutes, I did previously forget that we have a, a vacancy on the committee. So I get I, I announced the votes as if there were 15 members and we had one apology. We're actually at the moment we have 14 members and one apology today, which means the vote should have been out of 13. So just for the sake of the live stream, for the, the vote about the minutes being accepted as the record of the meeting being signed by the chairman, the vote was out of 13. We had 12 members in favour and one abstention. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That's lovely. Um, right, colleagues, um, it's now by my clock, 11.13. Um, I propose that we have a five minute comfort break now. So we come back again at 11.18. Well, actually, that's a bit too much. If we make it 11.20. So can we come back again at 11.20? So we've got time for a comfort break for a moment. Thank you very much.
right. Good after, uh, Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back again. Hopefully we can restart the meeting now, please. I um, hope that you've had a long enough break there. Um, we now start up again on item six, which is the Cornwall Contaminated Land Inspection Strategy 2020 to 2025. Uh, and that's back to James again, I believe. James Langley, please. Ooh. All right, sorry about that. Just uh, okay. the presentation ready. Um, Lovely job. I'll just get up on the screen. Gone again, James. It was them. It's gone again. So I'm sorting that out. <laughs> and uh, this slideshow. Right, can everyone see that? Yeah, well, that's there now, love. Thank you. Over to you. Okay, just uh, this is a quite brief presentation. Um, thank you, um, uh, Madam Chairman. Um, we're, uh, this is to introduce the Cornwall Contaminated Land Inspection Strategy, which was also brought before uh, members prior to this, and, and we've gone out to consultation. Um, the the consultation that we held uh, um, was was uh, with our stakeholders. It was quite limited. We had uh, 30 responses from public and stakeholder. 81% of respondents supported the main objectives of the strategy, uh, and 60% of respondents considered that the timescale for the strategy was reasonable. Uh, and we had obviously technical comments from our um, uh, stakeholders, such as the Environment Agency, Natural England, etc., which we've incorporated into the draft before you. Um, just to remind you what contaminated land is, um, we, 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 you've got to have a source uh, or you've got to have a, 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 some contamination and you've got to be in contact with it or a water course has got to be in contact with it to actually meet that legal definition of contaminated land for actually for it to cause harm. Um, so whilst we, we've probably got uh, some larger amounts of contaminated land here and there. They're, they're not actually causing harm at the moment because nobody's living on them. They're not near watercourses and they're not an issue. Um, the strategic inspection that we completed uh, prior prior to bringing uh, this report to you um, uh, it looked at the uh, the types of land. You probably can't read that very well, but the the, the big purple um, area is basically mining and mining and mineral refining, which is probably to do with our industrial heritage, uh, and that's probably the biggest proportion of our contaminated land in Cornwall, um, or potentially contaminated land in Cornwall. So just to bring on to the key aims of the strategy, uh, it's basically to to protect health of residents, control waters, ecosystems agriculture land buildings to the risk of harm of contaminated land. Um, uh, it's a statutory duty of ours, so we've got to comply with it. It sets out the objectives and the timetable in order to do that work. Uh, and the uh, it's a risk based approach, so we look at the pressing most serious problems first uh, and ensure that also ensure that anything going through planning where there's going to be new development on potentially contaminated land is adequately investigated and if necessary remediated through development. Uh, it's, yeah, it's a it's a five year plan that's considered best practice after uh, looking at um, uh, other local authorities and the statutory guidance. Five years, we believe, is a reasonable time scale to do uh, a preliminary risk assessments on 1920 sites. And that preliminary risk, uh, risk assessment will involve uh, a site visit uh, and uh, um, an officer making uh, drawing of a report around the information around that site. Um, it doesn't involve uh, any drilling or sampling at this stage. Um, this is to ensure that uh, land affected by contamination is effectively dealt with um, by the planning process. Uh, and um, also the, the strategy will ensure that council assets are compliant. And we've been doing a lot of work with our um, property services colleagues uh, uh, around assets and making sure that that's flagged up uh, when um, when when uh, uh, land is bought or sold. So what will success look like? 
Well, at the end of the five years, the health and the environment the people living are, are, are more protected from the, the harmful effects of land contamination. Land is redeveloped to a suitable standard to support healthy communities. We've got knowledgeable developers and landowners, so they're aware of their liabilities and responsibilities under the legislation. Uh, remediative areas that, that go through planning uh, are, are enhance the local environment, economy, and community. And at the end of the and uh, end of the process, we'll have a clearer picture of any outstanding risk, the harm or health of the environment, which we can sort of focus in on and address. So, um, very quick presentation, but um, uh, uh, I would like to sort of throw it out to you questions uh, and comments. And there's some things on 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 the slide there that you might want to consider. Thank you. That was, that was a quick one. That's lovely. Um, Martin Alvey is in first, please. Martin Alvey. Thanks, Chair. Um, looking at the uh, the report and on page um, 88 where we're talking about the options available and option 10.2, um, talking about um, the potential um, of doing more if we could recruit more um, specialist staff, although there's a shortage of said specialists. Um, quick question, how many specialists does the council currently have doing this work? Um, and in terms of the uh, sort of relevantly qualified people, is this something that you know, you're looking at somebody who's done a three year degree in or is it something that somebody with uh, an appropriate degree may have then gone on to do an additional course to, to qualify for them, them for. Um, and if that if the latter is the case, um, is there the potential within Cornwall for this training to take place? Bearing in mind we've got several excellent further education colleges and a university. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, we've got four officers who've got skills in contaminated land, although they are multidisciplinary, so they have other duties as well. Um, uh, and um, but uh, obviously to, we have 1920 sites to look at um, in order to do it in the five years uh, additional resource has been uh, obtained um, obviously subject to to recruitment um, but uh, yeah obviously that, that that person would either have to be a, 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 um, a, an environmental protection officer so they would have to have a degree in environmental science uh, or equivalent uh, and um, and would have to have some knowledge of the contaminated land system and uh, and uh, the, the legislation and the technical guidance behind it. So that's the sort of the skill sets we would. So yeah, it would be a degree qualified person we would be looking for in that role. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Steve Knightley next, please. Oh, oh hi, just a quick question really. Um, I, I mean, I, I like the report, but <clears throat> there's no mention of plastics and I know it's uh, about land pollution, but a lot of plastics which are dumped in the ground actually end up in the sea as well. And, and of course, th th this has been much publicised recently. Uh, it's been, well, maybe for a couple of years now, plastics are a real problem, but but the report doesn't seem to pay any attention to, pub, uh, uh, to plastics. I wonder if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, I mean, the the, the, it's, the, the regime, the, the legislation is quite specific with regards to substances, it's harmful substances and the uh, possibility of causing significant harm. And that test is a legal test which we have to prove quite, quite clearly um, uh, legally. So, you know, we have to prove either harm is occurring, somebody's getting ill or, um, or, or, or there's a significant uh, problem to soil water course or something like that. Plastics is interesting. Obviously, some of our contaminated land sites will have uh, uh, old plastics within it, uh, and obviously they will break down and drop in. So, when, whenever remediation has been, do, you know, been undertaken on sites such as that, we would obviously encourage removal of that material or at least encapsulation of that material to ensure that it doesn't get out into the wider environment. Um, but that's as far as I can go with that. Really, it's, it's whether it's causing harm is the key test. Well, well, sorry, if I could come back, Chair. Uh, are, are we suggesting, you know, un unlike sort of, um, we've been told by uh, lots of other people that plastics aren't harmful. I, I mean, I, I, you know, I understand there's there's poisonous um, products that get put down mines and all sorts of things, but but plastic is being uh, fairly right, uh, widely regarded as being harmful. Um, uh, okay, I mean, I, I do note your answer, but uh, I'm just a little bit surprised that maybe plastics aren't. Uh, in there somewhere. Uh, thank you. 
to, to, be, to be fair, um, uh, yeah, we, you know, in some of the, the, the areas of contaminant that we're looking at, there will be made up material which will have plastic materials in it and, and, and what have you. And obviously when we're managing those areas, um, those, those, those pieces of land for, you know, where they're causing significant harm, you know, obviously that will that, be addressed, but it doesn't specifically sort of say anything with plastic in we have to deal with. It's to do with the harm thing, really, to do with the legislation. OK, Steve. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dominic Fairman next, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so firstly, James, I just want to say that um, when this first came to committee back in November or whenever it was, um, it was um, a recommendation from the committee, really, that you produce a non-technical summary for, for people to reply to in the consultation. So I was really pleased to see that. Um, and I would like to reflect um, that we endorse that, um, what you've managed to do there in our recommendations in a second. Uh, but my question is around, um, you, you talk about being proactive about seeking out contaminating land. From memory, I think the Cornwall Council owns about 3% of Cornwall. So I just wondered if our own house is in order and if we, you know, we've got a grip on our own land first. Yes, th th thanks, Cass, uh, for me. Yes, we've um, we've been working quite closely with our, um, the, our the people that own assets within within the council. Uh, we are working quite closely with them on in terms of sharing knowledge and information about contaminated land. Obviously, one of one of our determined sites is is, is a council owned site. So uh, one of the areas we've already determined is contaminated land down at Church, Church Street in Falmouth has already been addressed, and we're looking at looking at that and obviously the mitigations around that. Uh, but yes, we, we we're sort of ensuring that our own uh, land portfolio is 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 um, you know looked after. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dominic, and thank you, James, for the answer. Uh, Mike Thomas, next, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and again, thank you, James, for for a very clear report. Um, on the slide that has the potentially contaminated land in Cornwall, is there any way that we can? even have a time scale for how things will get better or if they, will they get better? It used to be said had the Romans had nuclear power would still be guarding their dumps. Um, is it the case that we're going to have this for, forever um, um, or will it decline as time goes by? And then my other, other question is related to somebody mentioned about council 3%, or the council fairly mentioned the 3% land that we, we uh, are responsible for. I'm conscious there are quite a few car parks that have been created over time, taken over from the district councils, and I suspect that that tarmac laid down may conceal stuff that perhaps we need to be perhaps more aware of what's underneath some of them. Is that something that you're uh, working at as well? Thank you. Can you hear me? Sort of. Mike, I think there's a bit of feedback coming from your microphone. Can you turn your microphone yes, off? Yes, I'll turn my microphone off. Thank you. James. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just to come back on that, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, so um, with regards to um, uh, Half-Life, you, you're quite right. Actually, some, some, some uh, uh, sort of hydrocarbons will break down over time and parts of those hydrocarbons will become less volatile etc and stuff but obviously you do get products there are things like metals and things from our historic mining tend to be quite prevalent and will stay around for many years um so um yeah so what was the other question again about the uh the um the, the car park because i didn't the quite hear parks, yes the tarmac covering potentially issues underneath them yeah i mean obviously we're trying to protect public public health and that's the main thing so a barrier method may be uh may be the best way of, of protecting public health um sometimes it doesn't obviously address the issue and, and we have to look at the best remediation proposal dependent on, on the site itself so for example when we did the remediation options appraisal which is basically looking at all the options we were available to us when we were looking at church street i think it was in the millions millions and millions of pounds to to fully remediate the, the actual car park for not much more benefit to bring it back to being a car park um so um so we, we look at the the health risks we look at the risk to water and we consider whether it's reasonable and that's the approach we take through this legislation does that kind of explain that are you talking about church street in helston 
Uh, no, Church Street in Falmouth, sorry. Church oh, right, okay. Street, you, know, you know. Um, because there is a car park in Church Street in Helston, um, which I'll have to talk to you offline about. But uh, I am conscious that there are areas where previous councils in all uh, working in good practice at the time may have simply covered over stuff that um, may be potentially very dangerous. Are you aware or is that an issue at all? Uh, if it's, um, yeah, we it would, all of our sites should be mapped on our system and we'll be either on the site, um, but um, we, we would, um, we, we can we can have a chat offline about that particular site, that's no problem, but yeah, hopefully it's on our list of sites to do uh, and um, we, we will have a look at that and see what it is, but it would depend on whether it's near a water course and whether it's near whether it's near res residents, if it's just a car park, the risks to, to the people using it are probably going to be quite low, even though some of the contaminants might be quite nasty. So it just depends, uh, yeah, just depends on, on, on its situation and, and, and how it's being used. But obviously we can talk about a specific sites. I'm quite happy to chat about things like that. It's no problem. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. No, cheers. Okay. Thank you. Um, have we got anybody else with any questions, please, on this item, which is the contaminated land inspection strategy? I haven't got anybody else that's indicated. I'll just hang on for a second. No, if not, right, then we move to the recommendation, please, which is on page 75. Um, Dominic, I think you were saying that you wanted to add something else into it, or did I misunderstand what you meant? Can I come back to you again? Oh, here we are. Look, this is working well, isn't it? <laughs> So yeah, just um, just a small addition that I think we endorse the approach of producing the non-technical summary, uh, which was a recommendation from this committee. So I think we should um, endorse it. Brilliant. Right. So you're proposing that, are you? I am. Thank you. Happy to Brilliant. second. Thank you. Sorry, is that Happy Mike? To you oh, thank you, Mike. Any other proposals, or are we going ready to go to the vote on this one? Can you indicate an X in the box if there's any other proposals, any amendments or anything like that? Right, OK, so can I move across to Joe then, please? Um, so this is the recommendation we're suggesting. Uh, oh, somebody's got a nasty cough. Um, and it's proposed by Dominic and seconded by Mike Thomas. So if you could do the roll call, please, my love. Yeah, thank you, um, Chairman. Just for clarity, um, there probably would need to be two recommendations. One. Uh, one resolution by the committee that the committee endorses the approach of producing a non-technical summary for the purposes of public consultation. And then the second recommendation to um, Councillor Nolan that the um, Cornwall Contaminated Land Inspection Strategy 2020 to 2025 be approved. So I was just going to sort of make members aware of that, that it will it will be recorded as two separate recommendations. I hope everybody's happy with that. Right. If I just go back to Dominic and Mike then to make sure they're happy with that. Dominic, is that okay with you? Yes, I'm yeah, happy and, to take and, advice on that. Thank you, makes sense, doesn't it? And Mike, are you happy? Yes, thank, thank you. you. Right, so can you go around to the vote then, please, Joe? Yes, thank you, Chairman. So once again, roll, roll call. I'll collect your names and please indicate with, to me whether you're voting in favour, against, or you're abstaining. So Councillor Martin Alvey. Four. Councillor Malcolm Brown. Four. Nikki Chopak. Four. Councillor Dominic Fairman. Four. Councillor Pauline Giles. Four. Councillor Fred Greenslade. Four. Councillor Steve Knightley. Four. Councillor Matt Luke. Four. Councillor Cornelius Olivier. Four. Councillor Carolyn Rule. Four. Councillor John Simmons. Four. Councillor Mike Thomas. Four. And Councillor Kevin Towell. Four. Okay. So out of the 13 members um, present at today's meeting, um, all 13 are in favour, so that's carried. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much and thank you, colleagues. That's that's lovely. Right, so we're now ready to um, let me look on my on my agenda a minute. Uh, I did schedule in another break, a five minute break, but I don't think we need that because we only have one about half an hour ago. So if it's OK with everybody, I'd like to suggest we move straight on to item seven, which is the budget. Um, is everybody OK with that or does anybody feel they need a break? If you put an X in the box, if you think you'd like a break, that would be helpful. Great right. on, Chairman. 
OK, just move on. So then we move to the budget and we've come to this a little bit early. I've just texted um, Sophie to see if she's available, but I'm not sure whether she's with us yet or not. Sophie Hosking, are you there with us now? I'm with you, Chair. Ah, brilliant. Well done. Best laid plans. Um, so over to you then. Thank you. Ch Chairman, it's Joe Heather again. Can I just um, just raise that um, Simon Mould um, was going to join us as well. He's not on the line at the moment and I, I, so I'll just message him a moment to ask him to join the meeting. Do you want us to hold on till he gets here? Sophie, you're going to I think the first slides are for Sophie. I can, I can cover it until he joins us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm just bringing the papers up onto my screen. And, um, so thank you. So um, members will have received in their um, papers the, oh, hang on. I just, forgive me one moment, Cheryl, while I just get to the right place. Yes, of course. Um, for some reason, out of the 264 pages. Tracy spotted up on our screens, if that's any help to you. Oh, okay, yeah, no, I was just going to bring up the, the main report as well, actually on my screen, but that's fine because um, I'll come to the presentation in a moment. So right. I just wanted to draw members' attention to the actual main report mm -hmm. um, and um, which is a generic report which is being presented to all of the overview and scrutiny committees um, um, for the whole council. Um, the uh, presentation that we're going to take you through now um, is specific to the, the services and the remit of this committee and so goes into a little bit more detail behind it. Hopefully members um, received this a copy of this presentation yesterday. So um, with luck, you'll have been able to have a look through first, but we're now going to spend some time um, taking you through the presentation. What I would um, ask if it's all right, Chair, is if um, all the slides are numbered. So if members have got any questions relating to a particular slide, if they could just make a note of the number of the slide um, and we can take all the questions at the end. I think that way we will get through the presentation in a timely and considered way and then leave enough time for for as many questions as members would like to to raise. Um, would that be OK to proceed that way? Yes, yes, please, if you will. We've been doing that all through the meeting, actually, that we've waited for questions until the end. So um, we're in that habit now, so that's good. But it's great that the slides are numbered as well, so we can take account of those and we know exactly which one we, we want to ask a question on then. Great, thank, thank you, Sophie. You. You'll see them in the top right hand corner. So I'm going to um, so I'm going to actually hand over to Ellie, I think is on the call. I'm hoping it's Ellie. Um, who's going to take us through the first couple of slides and then we're going to then I will take us through the next batch and then I will ask the service directors to come in at the appropriate moments for their slides if, if that's all right. OK, handing over to Ellie now. <laughs> Thank you, Tracy. Can you move on to the next slide, please? So um, I think this is one of the most challenging and difficult years that um, I and uh, my finance colleagues have been involved with in trying to set a budget. It's an ever changing environment and um, this uncertainty means it is really hard um, to come kind of to set those budgeting assumptions. For example, last week, so after this report was um, published, the Treasury announced that the, their budget will be delayed until next year now and the speculation that there will be a single year spending review. And then yesterday, further guidance came out that the potentially that the new homes bonus scheme um, kind of might continue. So uh, what this means is the backdrop to, to kind of our budget is, is changing all the time. Um, and it does make it really tricky. However, under local government, we have a statutory duty to set a balanced budget. So therefore, we do have to work with what we know at the moment, and that's what we've um, what we've used in setting the um, kind of the budget um, that we've you've got before you. So we went into this budget setting round um, with an approved savings plan of £17 million and a budget gap of um, £12 million. Um, so that was what was approved in the MTFP in February. So kind of on roundings, it rounds up just to, um, under £30 million. When we then have put through the changes to the assumptions that we've had to make, so um, for example, changes to um, some of the council tax, the income that we might raise through council tax or business rates, um, this has meant that the gap, so that, that gap that we, we started with of 12 million has now increased to 19 million. 
Um, so it kind of it, it's increased that overall amount of money that we need to be able to find next year to be able to balance the budget. So that now that total requirement is £36 million that we have to find um, to kind of to, to, to get that break even position. And um, kind of over the four years, that, that's raising to almost £60 million. Um, but due to the kind of the amount of savings that the council has already um, already taken um, through kind of its creation since 2010, and for the size of the challenge that we've got that we're facing over the next four years, um, we're taking a very different approach to how we're setting the budgets. So we don't think that we can find this level of saving through kind of the more individual service based approach that we've taken before. Um, and it's um, it's really important that we are ensure that all of these these resources are really prioritised on those residents' um, priorities and kind of delivery of those frontline services. And um, to ensure that um, there's a, a transformation programme that's um, that's in starting um, with the, um, the the aim of being able to reshape the organisation so that services um, and our resources um, then are delivered um, on really focusing on those residents' priorities, but also then um, within that financial envelope that we've got going forward. And then the next slide, um, which Sophie's going to be taking you to, is, is talks more about that detailed transformation program. So some of those key areas to which we're going to be looking at um, for where um, potential savings will be able to be identified to help close that budget gap. OK, so if we move on to slide four, please, Tracy, thank you. So what what we're going to do for this is we actually need to rethink the way we um, we actually provide our services, as Ellie said. So what we're designing at the moment is something called our target operating model. So the, the model of the council that will deliver the services um, within budget um, that you need. Um, so in order to do that, in order to create this target operating model, we have a set of uh, design principles um, which provide that framework for us to, to, um, to rework the way we organise ourselves. Um, so um, underpinning all this, um, so there's no point doing all this unless we actually take the benefit of it. So there'll be a very clear, uh, what we call a benefits realisation process. So that says that if our plans um, to change the way we work and to remodel things um, are meant to be saving X number of million pounds, then we need to actually have a method to ensure that we are actually taking that X number of million pounds out, that you, can, you as members can see that that programme of work is happening and that we're not also just carrying on continuing to do all the other things that we were doing before that are costing us money. So that benefits realisation process is absolutely essential to have um, robust and for you to have good scrutiny of, I would suggest. Um, so in terms of the target operating model itself, we've been busy working on that and the design principles. And um, at the moment, as we go through the autumn, we are engaging um, and you members across the council um, to develop the detail of this. One of the fundamental um, um, premises behind this is um, outcomes based budgeting. Um, um, I'm, I call it um, reality based budgeting. So it's actually making sure that when we set our budgets, um, we actually spend that money on those functions and activities. Um, so traditionally, I think there has been a tendency just to um, not just to, but there's a, a tendency to, re to reset the budget every year in terms of service areas on a similar budget to last year, um, whether or not it has actually met, um, whether it's actually overspent or underspent. So there's generally a little bit of leeway in the budgets and if budgets are underspending, then it all gets evened out at the end of the year in the directorate by maybe propping up an area of overspend somewhere else. Well, actually, we don't want that. We'd, we, we would rather that the budgets are set as accurately as possible for the year ahead and there isn't um, that underspend overspend unless there's a genuine in-year reason for that to happen. So um, in order to help with the outcome based budgeting approach, which we'll see which we'll see differences in our budget setting this year, um, we um, have done some activity mapping and there's a slide on that later, which members who've been to the all member briefings will be familiar with. 
So um, what may happen out of this is there may be some pressures that are identified that maybe have always been there, but just haven't been very visible where budgets haven't necessarily been correctly set. But there may also be some new pressures coming, but hopefully we'll also find those areas where there's been a historic underspend and we'll, we'll hunt those out as well. Um, we may also um, find some new pressures which we'll need to find some corresponding savings. And that's where the, the difficult choices start to, to come into play. Um, there will be opportunities over the course of the autumn um, with you members um, to just uh, explore further ideas that you may have and that might be brought forward by us as well um, in order to, um, to find those further savings that are needed. If we could go on to the next slide, please, Tracy. Thank you. So the budget reduction strategy that we're um, presenting to you today as part of the, the overall strategy going forward is in um, a number of parts. And in year one, um, the, key, the key parts to it are we've already agreed that um, the savings in the MTFP for 21-22, and that's the tune of 16.6 million. There's also, um, within the council, we tend to uh, carry a number of vacancies and we, we have been using that as a way of um, maybe meeting budget variances at the end of the year. So what we tend to do is we tend to carry um, a number of vacancies and not fill them, save a little bit of money and then use that money where there's overspends at the end of the year. That's actually not a very clever way of managing your budget. What you should, What we should be doing is setting the staffing establishment to what we need because clearly if we're carrying all those vacancies we don't actually need them to do the job so we actually should trim down the staffing budgets so that they act 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 sorry accurately um, reflect what what staff we need and then use that that vacancy um, budget that we have been um, squirreling away at, to actually provide the services we need so it, it's just about making sure that you can see where your money is being spent, what it's actually being spent on. So what we're intending to do is say actually no, there shouldn't be um, a vacancy budget um, above 3%. There's, there's always going to be a little bit of carrying some vacancies, but it shouldn't be more than 3%. Um, and any additional we'll take out and that will go towards um, towards the budget reduction strategy. Um, so we've also, you members will know that we are currently um, targeting some reduction in posts through a voluntary severance scheme and we're hoping that we'll be able to manage um, any reductions in the workforce, certainly um, in the foreseeable future, through a voluntary severance scheme um, and also through the natural turnover. We have a, we have a turnover of staff of about 3.5% a year in any case. There'll also be a good focus on contract management. As you would expect, this is very good housekeeping. We currently spend 753 million every year externally. So driving down that is vital. Um, and we've got some slides on that later. In terms of uh, work design, um, we have, if we look across the council, we've got many duplicated processes. We've got lots of things happening in the same place where lots of different officers might um, be visiting certain properties or certain families and and actually if we can reduce the number of people who are having those uh, staff who are having those interactions then um, then that will make savings as well and also be better for the customer that they're not seeing too many people um, so where there will be savings around that and that's the that's at the heart of the transformation program um, in terms of the target operating model so we also need to um, review the numbers of layers of the organization and the um, and the spans of control, and um, we're developing job families, which fits in very nicely with the the new ways of working in terms of whether people need to work within an office environment, whether they need to are able to work from any environment, whether they are primarily based in the community. So that will um, inform our policies and our um, around how we how how we work, and that will also bring some um, savings in in turn. But, um, mainly in, in use of how we use our space and our premises. Um, there's also some technical accounting changes, which Ellie is much better placed to tell you about than I am, but in terms of um, some financial management, which we can um, which we can go to later if any members have got particular questions. Um, so the details can be worked up during the autumn and we will bring that back to members at um, overview and scrutiny in, in January. Um, there's some a few slides that I'm going to go on to here in terms of members who attended the all member briefings on finance will be familiar with this piece of work that we did earlier in the year where we actually looked at where we do spend our money 
and it's um, it's a bit of a it's probably quite difficult to see on your screens um but um but it essentially it shows where our expenditure is um in any given area what that's made up of and the bits in the pale salmon is the level of income that is is brought in against that expenditure as well i won't dwell on that one but um any members who are interested in further discussions are welcome to contact members of the finance team. Um, the next slide again shows a little bit of detail behind the activity mapping that we did. So broadly speaking, what, what that's telling us is the, the, um, the bits in blue relate to the neighbourhoods directorate, <coughs> sorry, um, and the, uh, the, the squares in black with the black text refer to the council as a whole. So for example, um, it's interesting to see that there are 95 uh, different kinds of activities described across all the directorates um, and 64 of those are activities are with, um, within the neighbourhoods directorate are found in other directorates too. So there may be some economies in scale in actually joining those up across directorates and that might um, lead to some savings there. Um, you'll see that as you would expect for this in the bottom left hand um, box as you'd expect for our directorate, our, our major spend areas are on um, household waste, fire attendance, um, street care and cleaning um, and uh, recycling, as well as the help and advice for adults is based mainly around our community safety services um, in, um, in, the in the communities and public protection service. So if we go on to the next one, um, this is a similar slide, but it also it shows the um, the numbers of full time equivalent, so the, the, the staffing structure against those activities in the directorate. Um, and again, the bottom left hand corner shows the um, where the key headcount is applied against those activities. Um, I think if we carry on to the next. So I talked a little bit earlier about um, the contract spend and how we need to drive that down. And um, I'm going to hand over to Angela in a minute, but before I do, it's, it's, it was surprising to me to see that we have uh, contracts with 1,242 suppliers in the year 2019 to 2020. 35% um, of the spend is with Cornish suppliers. I think that is um, for our directorate because we have the two huge waste contracts, um, which are, they're classed as external to Cornwall suppliers. So actually they employ their workforce in Cornwall. So they, a lot of that spend does go back into Cornwall, even though they might not be classed as Cornish suppliers in terms of the waste contracts, but obviously their workforce and their activity happens in Cornwall. So that is um, generating uh, money into the Cornwall economy. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Angela to take us through the next couple of slides around contract spend. Hi, thank you, Sophie. Can you hear me? Um, so in terms of this slide, this basically is detailing the key corporate indicators in relation to third party spend. And as Sophie pointed out, um, I expect what stands out for all of you initially is the 35% spend with Cornish suppliers. And to put that into context, that is totally based on the invoice having a local postcode. So it's quite a um, naive metric, really. It isn't really given the whole picture in terms of how uh, the council spend is impacting on the local economy. And there is some work ongoing at the minute in terms of the social value motion work in which we're investigating the the national TOMS, so TOMS again, but this in this context is themes, outcomes and measures. And this is really looking at how the council spend, how we can factor into procurement and ensure that we're meeting um, targets in terms of jobs, growth, local spend. So that's something that we're in the process of developing and I think that's going to come back later this year. Um, in terms of the number of suppliers, it is interesting. It does seem to be a huge figure. However, um, when we think of the spread of services in the directorate, it's it's really difficult to make a comment on that at the moment. Um, there is a, a big piece of work ongoing at the minute 
it, looking at our data and cleansing it. And also there's a, a great deal of work being undertaken by the operational sourcing team to look at what we call tail spend. And that's really in relation to each time we process an invoice or we set up a supplier that has an admin and process cost, which is quite significant. But obviously what we've got to do is consider this in terms of local micro businesses and we don't want to be, I don't want to make it difficult to us and just focus on the larger organisations. So it's really a balance and um, that will be further work being undertaken. Can we still work with these small suppliers, but perhaps in a, a more efficient way? Okay, thank you. Tracy, could we go on to the next slide, please? So this slide is, as it states, detailing the top 10 suppliers by value. Um, I do apologise for the, the graph on the right. That is incorrect. It's picking up data from due north based on annual spend and it's not it's not correct as you'll see in the next slide but what I'd like to point out on this slide is within this top 10 of suppliers four of them being Cornwall Energy Recovery Limited, We Are With You, First Light and RNLI are not deemed Cornish suppliers and they make up some over 50% of the spend. So as you can see, that puts that 35% in context. It's, it's not really telling the whole story. Um, so perhaps Tracy, if you could go on to the next slide. Thank you. Lovely. <clears throat> so as you can see, these are the strategic and cr critical contracts for neighbourhoods and it details the expiry dates. And uh, as you can see on the previous slide, it's not accurate because we have a significant value of contracts ending in 22 and 23 and obviously work is ongoing at the minute on all of these contracts to re-procure them within our team. Okay, I think that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. So the next thing we want to talk to you a bit about is demand um, and how that drives spend and where we may or may not be able to control that as we go forward. Um, so demand management is, is about changing how we work, uh, what our role and responsibilities are with customers um, in order to seek alternative ways of meeting their needs. Um, so um, a simple um, thing about that might be the use of more computer technology so that people can do things for themselves online rather than um, having to go through a contact centre and then be referred to the back office and then have to maybe fill a form out online or uh, um, on the phone. They can do that from the comfort of their own sofa at any time they want. So that would be a, um, a way of, of changing the demand on the contact centre and the back office services and using modern technology to do that. Um, so um, demand led services are mainly, in, in the main, they're about um, things that um, responding to people, so people-led services, so things like social care, um, people presenting as homeless or needing housing help, um, and then things like waste collection. So we know that the more houses and the more residents we have, um, the more properties we will be collecting waste from and the more expensive that service gets to, to deliver for us. Um, and without intervention in this, those demand-led budgets will continue to get bigger and bigger um, and therefore taking a larger proportion of the overall budget. Um, if we go on to the next set of slides, um, so we're going to just, I'm going to hand you over to the service directors and um, Pete is going to come in first and he's just going to talk to you a little bit about waste and then we'll go through the other services. Okay, um, thank you Sophie. So just, just following on from what Sophie's saying, the top line on this slide, apologies there are a lot of numbers, I'll just point out the top, the top section is the number of dwellings and you can see that we are on a trajectory of, of, of increase across the top of the slide there from the position in 1819, uh, 274,000 households. Obviously, <coughs> number of households is expected to continue to rise and then that in itself does create a, a greater demand on on waste. You'll, you'll see the, if I just point out the third line up from the bottom, which is curbside recycled waste, <coughs> you'll see at the minute that our our numbers in 1920 at 35,000 are quite low. We do expect with the change in regime to be to be up to a more steady state of around 67,000 um, tonnes collected at the curbside of recycling. And you'll note a corresponding reduction then 
in in curbside um, waste. Broadly, the numbers stay the same. You can do the maths for yourself. The very bottom line talks about the total waste collected. We do see that increasing, but the proportions and the way in which we do it will probably change as we become um, more more efficient and as we get more and more of our our residents to recycle or do things differently. We will be collecting food waste separately, but um, I've, I've in the lockdown period um, got myself a green Joanna and all of my food waste now ends up in, in composting in my garden. So I would hope that we, we, we get more and more residents embracing that type of thing so that we keep demand managed. If we move on to the next slide. This one just talks about the budget um, and the budget in the in 18, 19 and 1920 have been really on the back of a very um, a very good value collection contract. That collection contract, as we all know, and you will remember through the budget process, does see an increase. We've had we had the the challenge of, of that procurement last year. So you will see an increase in costs as we as we move forward into the following years. And that that's still something that is a a pressure that we will need to deal with. Next slide and next presenter. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions at the end. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um, if I can just uh, talk on fire, there's a lot of information across the next two slides, but uh, there's a couple of areas that I'll draw your attention to in terms of key points. And I think in the first instance, if we refer to the top graph, where we can clearly see some seasonal impacts, an increase on demand, predominantly rising in July and over the August periods. This actual data now will support us in some planned work, realigning resources to risk and demand, which will be achieved for us working differently. Uh, pleased to state that in the overall, in the last three years, although a steady number of 999 calls, there has been a very steady reduction in the number of overall incidents this is resulting from a call challenge in control at the time of receiving a 999 call and uh, subsequently our prevention and protection activities which also take place. I think the key elements to pull out of the bottom graph so generally informing us that our main incident type which is increasing is the number of automatic fire alarms which we abbreviate to AFAs. Um, four years ago you worked with us where we undertook a piece of work and consultation which reduced our attendance to AFAs by 50% at that time but based on this study um, in the numbers, this is something that we will revisit um, to propose what further actions we can put in place to reduce unnecessary and I will reinforce unnecessary fire service attendance to uh, premises and buildings. Thanks Tracy, next, next slide. Uh, this is very much about understanding and forecasting our revenue budget as Sophie described earlier in, in, in the previous slides. Of interest here is the time directly linked to cost spent dealing with fire as opposed to false alarms and special service calls such as road traffic collisions and I think if we drill down further you will not be surprised that it's our demographics and risk profile that predominantly account for the larger percentage being that of wildfires, agricultural fires, barn fires which also has an impact on our clean air and environment. The below graph shows our forecast up until uh, year end 23-24 and you will see for the last two years that we have had a year end position being an overspend position. We are trying our utmost to manage and deliver the fire and rescue service budget with our forecast aligned to the set budget. But you will have heard sort of many times with 70% of our firefighters paid on a pay on use basis. It is an extremely cost effective model opposed to staffing every fire station with full time firefighters. But there will be some fluctuations in our forecasting predominantly due to operational activity such as uh, multiple severe weather events which can negatively impact on our year end position. We are starting and we are looking to recover cost as much as possible and predominantly around special service calls where there will be insurance involvement and I can give a recent example of a commercial building where some roof panels became loose recently in strong winds and we attended to secure and uh, make safe. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Tracy. And over to Pete or Simon. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, members. Uh, just a, a quick couple of slides. 
So first slide that you've got in front of you is just exploring the uh, demands now placed on drug and alcohol treatment. Just so you're aware that the demand we are seeing is on the increase. So the first graph is just showing you expenditure versus number in treatment. And just along the bottom, just showing some of the key injects that have happened um, along the way. If I can just bring some key points out in that. Um, some of the conditions that promote the, the, the increase that we're seeing around uh, deprivation, poverty and trauma. And the same conditions that we can see promoting drug and alcohol also impact mental health and physical health and crime. Um, so that you're aware the drug and alcohol budget pays for all community drug and alcohol services, including structured treatment, outreach, needle exchange and the drug and alcohol team staff members. The uh, chronology that you can see in front of you shows the last 10 years for the budget for drug and alcohol, depicting a reduction of 32%, whilst if you note that the numbers in treatment have increased 8%. In simple terms, this means that the funding per person in treatment has now reduced overall by 37%. Um, that's excluding the further reductions in the uh, streams coming forward, which are predicted for Think Family of 130,000 and OPCC funding of 130,000. Um, from a, a cost benefit per perspective, it's worth noting that the gross annual budget is £11,200 per person saving for any one individual in drug and alcohol treatment. If I just look at how that expenditure and increase of demand looks across performance so you can get a comparator, um, you'll notice that the services continue to improve uh, performance, but it reached a point of um, where we're having special attention with public health between 2014 and 2017. And we started, oh sorry, could I move to the next slide please? Thank you. Um, you can see where the, the performance has just started to drop now. So we hit a peak uh, when we, we changed the funding mo model back in 17-18 at 29%. Um, and that's where we were confident that we'd dri driven out the maximum efficiencies from the system and our performance and that wider system uh, benefited had been realised. Since then, we are experiencing a demand in numbers of treatment rising across county lines, the complexity and a COVID-19. Um, Cornwall's treatments uh, penetration rates are still and remain above the national average. Uh, which means that in simple terms, we have been successful at getting more of our predicted numbers of people into treatment. Our performance does still remain in the top quartile, but is just starting to decline, as you can see. Just to give you an understanding of, of numbers, we have an estimated 2,000 opiate or crack users, and we have an unmet need of 37% of that population against a national of 54%. And we've got 6,700 predicted people dependent drinkers, and we have a 75% unmet need currently against a national average of 82%. Services have worked extremely hard to look at how we can do that. In addition, we are seeing now that we're getting new emerging drug users and rural counties are being targeted by organised crime gangs, uh, which is increasing high purity, low cost heroin and crack cocaine. Um, what we are cognizant of and the evidence is telling us is not spending money on in these individuals does increase cost across the whole system. Um, and our assertive outreach approach so far, we have analysis that is showing that where we have got high packed impact users working with emergency services, we've seen a 60% drop in demand, which is resulting in significant savings. Um, so noting that through um, to meet the current level of demand and to start moving back toward that optimum level, we would need to be looking at an increase of expenditure uh, to, to support that or the option is we would need to look at uh, introducing waiting lists so that we would be able to ensure safe systems of work in that place. Thank you. If I could move to the next slide. Um, other area of demand just to bring to your attention is ASB caseworkers. Um, currently the ASB team uh, in base budget pays for three ASB caseworkers. Um, across the 10 years, we have seen a 50% reduction there. Currently, since 2015, some of that shortfall has been met by the external grant funding for the Together for Families, but that is due to cease at the end of this year. As members will be aware, they provide support for victims, including out victim risk assessments. They work for prevented for individuals uh, from ASB using the ASB warning systems, and also where required, will take on board enforcement act activity building case 
uh, case files uh, going all the way through uh, to prosecution. Um, with regard to the drivers, again, similar to what we've just explained around um, drug and alcohol, we are seeing new emerging groups of drug users whose behaviours in towns and communities is more challenging. And again, those rural counts, uh, counties are being targeted uh, with high purity, low cost heroin and crack cocaine, exploitation of children and vulnerable adults, uh, resulting in increase of shoplifting and criminality, and also showing increased challenging and unpredictable behaviour. From regards to the demand perspective, as well as seeing more complex needs coming forward, we've actually seen an increase in reported ASB uh, by 7%. And during uh, the lockdown period, ASB rose to 38% with an increase in rowdy and inconsiderate behaviour and nuisance neighbour and street drinking. We still believe that those volumes are not starting to decrease and with a downturn in, a, in the economy, it could be that they will continue to grow. Um, overall, our performance has been consistent over the last 10 years, but we are now starting to see for the first time a drop in that performance linked both to the demand and also with uh, our ASB interventions with adults and young people's failing to meet those set targets. And that's reflecting a continuing trend we've noted from last year uh, with more complex, more gang activity. Uh, current risks will mean that we'll be uh, unable to undertake some of those critical ASB activity at the moment. With regards to cost of return, uh, it's estimated that the cost to respond to ASB in 2018 was 5.1 million, which was uh, 12,300 incidents. And there's a return on investment for ASB family support projects of between 17 and 44 pound for every, pen, every pound spent. So there would be a, a look and an ask to how we could increase the ASB or maintain to the previous levels. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, finally, um, for, for, for me, uh, with regards to domestic abuse and sexual violence, uh, over the last five years, uh, the team have worked extremely hard to build confidence in the police and services to increase the number of people coming forward. If you look at the national estimates, however, though, for victims of domestic abuse in Cornwalls and Isles of Scilly, uh, the number is around 23,100 victims in a year, uh, of which two thirds are women and one third are men. Uh, national research indicates that around one in five children have been exposed to domestic abuse. If you look at the number in contact with our domestic uh, services in comparison, over the last 12 months, uh, it is 4,446, which is only looking at a 19% prevalence of that estimated 23,000 population. In addition, we've just had over 9,500 incidents reported to the police in the last 12 months of domestic abuse, and that's shown a 4% increase uh, over the last, um, uh, last 12 months. We are starting to see an increase in referrals to commission domestic services above that of pre-COVID levels. So we've seen a 9% increase in referrals to services between the end of the year and August 20. What we are also seeing is an increase of complexity of clients post lockdown with people now needing more intense support. So daily contact as opposed to weekly. The existing demand for domestic abuse and sexual violence services uh, is currently outweighing the capacity. Uh, the demand mapping across the system in 1920 showed uh, the highest uh, demand. So again, uh, we, we would be looking to see how we would be able to hold the funding for that system as it is continually increasing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Simon. And uh, um, hello, uh, members. Um, just very briefly, I think it's the last slide on, on demand uh, from from me. Just a, a, a note, really, that in terms of demand um, and how that affects some of our public protection services, uh, coronavirus, coronavirus has had an impact in that uh, we had uh, demand has continued uh, at the same time as our income to pay for some of the activities that deal with that demand had dropped rapidly. Um, we've uh, our operating model within public protection means over 50% of our our activity for environmental health staff or trade staff or licensing um, is funded via income. Uh, but over the uh, the course of the of the pandemic, our income um, has fell has fallen dramatically, uh, whilst demand hasn't. Um, so that has affected the registration services, licensing, and and, and probably uh, business support as well. And what we've found over this period of time, whilst that income has dropped, 
um, the demand for our services and in probably in particular how we support businesses to recover, to reopen safely um, has, has increased. So uh, we have a, a bit of a problem in that there is that, that gap between the income that pays for those services and the demand has, has widened and that's likely to, to remain with us, not just for this year, but possibly into next year as well. So uh, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one thing I did want to mention as part of this presentation is the um, the way we work in partnership with other people. Um, I'll switch my video on, sorry, didn't realize that was off. Um, the way we work in partnership and, um, and actually this is really important, not only for achieving better outcomes for the community and for our residents and businesses, but also in terms of efficiency of working models. So um, we've got a number of key external partnerships um, so we break the partnerships down into sort of three different kinds. So the key external partnerships through things like the Tri-Service Responders and Safer Cornwall and, and our library partners in town and parish councils delivering our library services. And then we've got what we think of as our contractual partnerships. So these are two big waste contracts, the contracts um, for community safety that Simon was just talking about, things like the RNLI who've been invaluable on our beaches this summer, um, and also our partnership with um, Cormac and CoreServe in terms of delivering some of our services. But we've also got some opportunities around our internal partnerships, so within the council. So for example, Fire and Rescue Service do, um, do work for adult social care in terms of targeting individual households where people are vulnerable and at risk. Um, we've got partnership opportunities across all of the different service areas where we do work for each other. And I think there's, there's definitely under the new target operating model, there are there are ways of operating which will make better use of those partnership opportunities. Um, so I won't go on about that. I think if we could move on to the next couple of slides. Tracy, actually, can I bring you in to just um, talk us through some of the numbers? Um, I'm afraid the slides are a little bit, um, you might not be able to see the numbers so well on the screen, but, but I'll hand over to you, Tracy. I, yeah, thanks. Um, I'm just going to, we've put this slide in just to give you some context in the budget um, for the Neighbourhoods Directorate. So you can see from the first pie chart that as a directorate, their gross budget is um, just under 147 million. Um, and we just wanted to show that actually 54% of the spend within the directorate is actually um, tied up in contracts and with third parties. And that's part of the slide that Angela took you through earlier. Um, and then just around a third of the budget is, is staff spend and we'll be looking at what reductions are happening in that through the workforce reduction program that's currently happening. So that leaves, you know, quite a small element of, of the budget that the directorate spend is outside of that then. Um, and then the second pie chart on the right hand side is um, to just show you the income that the directorate generates. Um, so the blue and the red wedge is kind of like their grants that they receive and that's predominantly within the fire service for the, the firefighter pensions that we receive and some funding from home office and some smaller grants within some of the other services as well. Um, the purple element which um, it says income recharges um, and that actually relates to the recharge of the public health grant that funds a lot of the services within the community safety area that Simon um, took you through just now as well. Um, and then that leaves the green element, which is the, the true external income um, and the, ch the charges to external customers and clients that the directorate charges for. Um, so that's really what we wanted to show on that slide. OK, and I think it's probably worth noting that that's a, a just under a quarter of our gross expenditure. We get back in income, don't we? Is that about right, Tracy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, if we go to the next one. Um, what I want to just talk, just cover very briefly here is where we know we've got some underlying pressures. So where we know that um, we're not either not meeting our budgets or we've got um, additional expenditure, which um, which will um, which we need to consider for for budgets this year and that, for next year for 21-22. So Simon's already covered the, um, the the top three, which are in relation to um, community safety, where we know um, we've got. Um, for example, two of the caseworkers, the funding, um, the external grant funding finishes for those um, and the public health funding is um, is at risk for the, um, the top two items. Um, in terms of the Cormac contract, um, we know that uh, due to the ageing condition of assets and the impact um, on reactive budgets for compliance for health and safety issues, we know that there's a, 
a, a spend a, a revenue pressure there of about 170,000 um, for next year. And also, um, we've still got a number of public conveniences that we haven't quite managed to solve yet. We've um, we've um, done massively well on the program, but there's still a cost to maintaining the few that we are still trying to to devolve. Um, there's an underlying pressure in the Cornwall Archaeology Unit. Historically, that budget is supposed to generate um, an, a small income for the council, um, but actually what we've seen um, is a um, an overspend um, every year recently, and that's a historic challenge. And um, we need to, th so when I was talking about right-sizing the budgets and being realistic about, about budget setting, we need to address that in next year's budget setting process. Um, and similarly, we have got some um, uh, some income targets in Fire and Rescue Service for um, Phoenix Services and for the CCTV income, which are um, unrealistic. So whilst the services absolutely wash their face and they certainly um, pay for themselves, they are in no way able to generate the levels of income that have been required of them through the budget setting process. So those are the known pressures. If we move on to the next slide, we've also got some um, some pressures that we're identifying now, which I need to draw to your attention. Um, so again, there's um, funding in communities for um, uh, which has been funded by uh, families, uh, uh, the children's services in Together for Families, and also some money being withdrawn from the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner. We, there's been a re-evaluation of um, some of the Grey Book roles in the Fire and Rescue Service, which we need to address because that will um, be a uh, future cost pressure because um, that um, it's shown that the re-evaluation has, has brought those roles out higher. Um, and there's also the pension um, top-up grant funding is being withdrawn for fire, so we need to, there'll be a gap there. For waste, there is um, contract inflation and the indexation challenge. So that we know that there are increasing pressures there and that will need to be reflected in the leading term financial plan, um, though we will work with the contractors to, um, to make any, um, any improvement on that position that we possibly can. Um, within the environment, um, there are challenges in the devolution programme and I think um, this year the, um, the COVID pressures haven't helped us on that one. So town and parish councils who maybe had been considering taking on some assets um, which might have generated a little bit of income or um, may not be doing that. So there may be some second thoughts around some of the devolution programme and that will present a budgetary challenge to us, which we were not able to quantify particularly at the moment. But um, we're, we are looking at potential pressures from that collection of, of risks um, of around six million. If we could move on, um, this is just really to show you where we have identified savings that are currently in the medium term financial plan. Um, we are committed to making these. Um, if we don't, then that would add additional pressure um, onto future years. But um, I'm, I'm confident that we will, will meet these targets. And then if we go on to this final one. So just this is really the, the final slide in the pack. and. What we're, we're asking you to reflect on. So this is this is the start of the the budget setting process. Um, what we're asking you to do today is to sign up to to the to the principle of it um, and to approve uh, to approve the approach that we're taking. Um, but over the coming months, what we would really like you to do is um, think about those areas that we can um, target for um, that you might be thinking about in terms of. The feedback you're getting um, as you're out and about and your knowledge of council services in terms of where there might be opportunities for efficiencies or reduced spend um, what's what's more important to you what's um, what what we might have a bit of wriggle room on um, and if you've got any suggestions as well we may be capable of stopping services or doing less of them or doing them to a different standard so um, there is just um, a point of procedure. There is a slightly revised recommendation to the report. So the report that um, was published last week with the agenda pack, um, there's a change of wording in the first recommendation. And this uh, really came out uh, after the Hassos meeting last week. So that um, in the third line there, they, in bold you have forms rather than notes, I think. I think it was in notes, it's now forms. So that, that was just to make sure you're aware of that. I'll stop now and um, hand back to you, Chair.
thank you, Sophie, and, and all of your colleagues there. That was a uh, um, very interesting presentation, and I'm glad that you took the time to take us through it as you did, um, because I, I struggle myself. So, I mean, you, you made it very clear and understandable, so that was really good. Thank you. Uh, I know there's an awful lot of work goes in behind to actually get it to look, look simply, simplified like that, so I'm really grateful. Um, colleagues, um, we did take a long time with the presentation, but that was a deliberate act. I asked Sophie to take us through it slowly. Um, there is plenty of time for questions. If we need to, I don't want you to feel we're going to cut any debate short. If you need to, we have got the provision that we can go on into a second Teams meeting if we want to. So um, we'll just go down through and see how we get on. Um, so first of all, is Cornelius Olivier, please. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, just Carolyn. I mean, um, I, that was an interesting presentation, but I would describe it as sobering above all. Yeah. Um, the, 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 do you mind, I, I will try and get through the questions I've got now rather than come back as we're under pressure from, t from, from tears. But Sophie did make a reference early on about, you know, carrying vacancies and perhaps if we were carrying vacancies, perhaps we didn't need the jobs. Alternatively, it could be said perhaps the jobs just aren't being done. And too often, I think when we talk about doing things differently, we end up talk, in practice, that means doing them less effectively. So when we're talking about directly personal services, drugs and alcohol, abuse, public health related stuff, whether that's health visitors or, or you know, sexual health services, to trim those things back, you, you're really running the risk of false economies. And I think that's, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not an expert on all this stuff, but I do know something about the drugs and alcohol services. And to lose that would have a very detrimental effect in terms of ongoing costs and the quality of life of Cornish residents as well. The, the impact that, that the reduction of those services would have on them. I mean, it's easy for me to say this because I haven't got to make it add up. I do appreciate that. You also mentioned um, the point about devolution, perhaps being on hold, devolution of assets. Well, some Cornish towns are very ready to make demands of the council. Um, I represent one of them. I'm fine with that. But they're less responsible when it comes to taking on assets which they could perfectly well manage. So I'm, I'm wondering if there needs to be a bit more of a link between what towns receive and what they're willing to take on. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't object to Cornwall Council taking that approach with Penzance at all, uh, personally, because I think one of the problems with the devolution of assets is if those have been very successful in some areas, it's actually been very patchy, in other words, in, in other ways, in, which includes the area I represent. Um, the point about suppliers, tw you know, 35% of the spend is on Cornish suppliers, but there are 1,242 suppliers. I'd like to know what percentage of the suppliers are Cornish as, as well as as the spend. I know that um, that might not seem like, you know, perhaps it's the money that counts, but I would be very interested to see because that would tell us whether we've got lots and lots of local small suppliers. So what percentage of the 1,242 suppliers are Cornish? And um, the final point I come to, because I don't want to crowd um, anybody else out, is um, members of the Economy Scrutiny Committee uh, were, were victims of a calmly apocalyptic briefing by Glenn Kaplan the other week in which he talked about the Cornish economy not actually getting back to where it was pre-pandemic for about five years. It was a that was it was quite stunning to hear that. So clearly the council has has not just got to sort of look at its its budget. It's got to look at it in a way that regenerates the Cornish economy um, post COVID. I know the government's not making that any easier for us, but one thing we haven't touched upon is, and, and we wouldn't perhaps for this committee, is capital expenditure. What are we going to do? How are we going to spend money that regenerates the Cornish economy? You know, and that might be more appropriate for the, the economy committee when they talk about housing investment program and stuff like that. But I, I, at the same time as we're talking about better, making better use of the money, part of making better use of the money is this economic regeneration as one of the harder hit parts of the country by you know, COVID related economic decline. Uh, that's all I wanted to say at, at this time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Cornelius. I think some of those, as you rightly said, are probably not for this committee, but I'll, I'll hand it over to Sophie, if I may, to or, or whoever you need to bring in, if you would to answer those. 
I, I, I would like to answer that last point because I do think it is relevant to this committee, particularly through Alan's services um, in business support. So um, quite a lot of this, um, the um, income that we generate in Alan's service is through providing crucial support to businesses to keep them um, compliant and legal and operated safely and well in our um, in our communities. Um, now, that is not generating a lot of income at the moment because businesses are, are not able to engage with those services. However, um, therefore, in the model that we've developed in, in that area of our, of our work, um, it, what we would normally do is if they're not making the income, we wouldn't employ the officers. You know, we would reduce our headcount proportionally. However, um, my concern is that if is that we won't um, get that income back up to the levels we're used to seeing next year and maybe even the year after. And therefore that, uh, but, but those officers are absolutely crucial with their knowledge and their support to businesses to help businesses get up back on their feet, not necessarily through income generating mechanisms. But so for example, over the last few months, they've been absolutely instrumental in webinars to help businesses understand all the different regulations that have been coming out and helping them make sure that they're compliant with all the COVID regulations. So there, so absolutely, as we go into the budget setting next year, we may see that there's a pressure on those budgets because they're not generating income and they need to be. So, so you're you're completely right to to point that out, Councillor. Um, in um, in relation to your other um, questions, we'll come back to you on the suppliers. I don't know what percentage, but I would suspect that a lot of the smaller suppliers. That the reason we've got so many suppliers um, in the, against this directorate is because a lot of them are smaller ones. So I think you're right on that point there. Um, the devolution of assets, interesting one. So um, I think I would take the view that um, town and parish councils are democratic and are um, in in the way that we are. It's um, and that um, if they so we are it, we would encourage them to bid um, to to engage with us in terms of devolution talks, and we would always try and set up any of those um, those devolution. Um, deals in, in a way that makes them sustainable going forward for the future. So, um, uh, and that's the conversations that we will continue having. The vacancies management. Um, so, yes, I, I agree with you. There are absolutely vacancies that you would not want to carry. And there are also vacancies of this if you take them, have a detrimental impact in other areas of the council. So they might have um, unintended consequences. But as a whole, the council as a whole through across all of its staffing structures, um, does tend to use vacancy management as a, um, a budget balancing exercise as opposed to um, as opposed to actually putting stuff where they're needed. And I think I, I'm with you. We need to actually work out where the functions are needed, staff accordingly, um, but not faff around on the edges trying to squeeze um, um, sort of budget strategies out, out of what, what should be a much more transparent staffing structure. Um, so that's probably enough for me, Carol. Then I'll, um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll get, let, let you get on to your next questions. I see you've got a whole list in that side. Yes, I have. Thank you. Uh, the next question is Pauline Giles, please. Hi, um, I'll give Sophia a little break for just one minute and, and ask Mark. These Troy service officers, what is the cost of their training? Because the one we had in our area lasted, well, I don't think he lasted more than more a few weeks. Uh, and I'm concerned that we, you know, we are using our budget to get these these guys trained up. And, you know, if they were here on a permanent basis, I would say, yes, great. But we do seem to be um, throwing money at, at their um, their training and then they disappear to pastors new. So that's one. Uh, and uh, Sophie, I, I'm looking at the public uh, conveniences evolution. Uh, you know, there is still a cost uh, to, to Cornwall Council through the precepts. Uh, and I'm feeling like this is a bit of a backdoor way of getting out of uh, it out of our budget and into somebody else's. It feels a bit like we're bailing out our boat to sink somebody else's. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, um, Councillor Charles. If I can sort of come back in on the first instance, with regard to the tri service safety officers, um, you'll be aware that um, it's, uh, it's it's a project that's sort of growing. So we had one initially, we recruited to three, we recruited to ten. Um, three individuals have moved on. Now, one of the tri service safety officers have progressed into the police, and two of the tri service safety officers have moved into full time firefighters. So, in terms of the sort of the training cost, 
that ha actually sort of hasn't been wasted because um, it would have been sort of covered anyway in terms of their next sort of career progression. So I am aware at this current time that we've recruited two third of tri service safety officers, which have come from a fire background. So significantly their training has, has been enhanced and the speed of that um, has been achieved a lot more quicker. And we have got a proposal sort of going forward that we can build into our base budget where we recruit over the sort of the 10 that we had agreed. So if someone sort of progresses into another service, such as um, the police or the fire, we won't actually sort of lose that resource. But in the meantime, because we've dropped from 10 to 7, we have created that vacancy. So actually it's a profile budget, which is now given a saving. So hopefully that explanation um, is understandable. I'm happy to pick up off, offline if you require any more information. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And then before I hand over to Pete on the public conveniences, I'll just make the quick point that, um, so there's, there's two things here. One is um, I'm a true believer in the that the right decisions need to be made at the right local level. So, so there are decisions made locally for local communities that are very appropriately to be made at, at the lowest level possible. Um, and that might be about the assets we serve that particular team. But there's also the issue that whether we like it or not, um, we have huge budget pressures and a limited ways of raising income. The parishes and town councils do have a lot more freedom in their ability to set precepts. Um, and that's it's an unhappy truth, but I'll hand over to Pete on, on that question. Yeah, I, th I think I've seen some really good practice of, of, of local management at a local level. So places like Mervagissi that, that use um, elements of volunteer um, cleaners, they also raise some money from second homeowners by the local member knocking on some doors. And I know not every area has that, that luxury, but it's been really, um, it's seen an improvement. There's cut flowers in the toilets in Memagissi now. The Natural History um, group displayed some photographs of old Memagissi and, and there's some been really, um, Goran Haven as well, I think the, the, the two, I think, I think I'm talking about Goran Haven actually, but the Goran Haven, that's the, that's the example of something being done locally better than done from, from Truro. So it's not always a burden that passes if if there's innovation and, and and local local volunteers and the like brought into to being but i do equally accept pauline that there are times when when absolutely the burden does fall onto onto council taxpayers through the precept from lo local councils as well but it's about local services hopefully that helps uh, i just want to sort of highlight if i may tar uh, tar and Par parish council uh, I am actually a ratepayer in that area, even though um, I'm the council of St Blasey, and they have spent tens and thousands of uh, preset money um, repairing these darn toilets because of vandalism and everything. So, you know, I just want to make the point that yes, a lot of places maybe they have, have benefited from it, but I'm not sure that we have. Right, thank, thank you, Pauline. Um, next one is Mark and Brown, please. Um. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm grateful to you for letting me come in fairly early because I've already told you I have to leave in about 10 minutes. I'm really, so <clears throat> I'm really sorry because I would like to vote on this. Um, I think Councillor um, Olivier was absolutely right. This is sobering, and um, um, unless I'm wrong, even if even if the pandemic hadn't occurred we would be in the position that we would be having um, to reduce our expenditure in in some areas. So I think we need to reflect that in in the language and also in the language that I know officers are probably partly employed to present um, as positive of a spin on all of this as possible. But I think we just I think the residents will accept if they're told honestly that if we are reducing expenditure on some services that means the service is going to get poorer and I, I just I just think it's not honest to try to maintain anything different. Um, I'm not going to help a lot today I must admit because I can't see areas where we can cut spending um, significantly and for there not to be consequences. So I'll, I'll, I'll just make one principle, which may make me come across as a barbarian, but there we are. I think in a way, I'm, I'm less concerned at the moment about places looking pretty 
than people being able to walk around safely. And if there was one one bit of the presentation that um, I struck struck me as being the most significant, that was what Simon Mould had to say um, about the antisocial behaviour and the drugs issues. I think antisocial behaviour is a very is a very poor phrase because it gives the impression that it's less it's less significant than what it really is. To me, um, antisocial behaviour means you get to a state that people are reluctant to go into a town centre to do their shopping because they don't like the experience there and they feel harassed on the estate that they live on. And I really do think um, cutting the number of antisocial behaviour um, officers or I suppose more accurately, picking up the funding which otherwise was partly through a partnership which doesn't exist at the moment. In my view, that is the top priority of everything that we've heard today for the, for the savings or the growth areas that we have to try as best we can to um, incorporate in, in the budget. I also think, um, and I, I, I do take Councillor Giles's point, that when parishes take on assets, it's an unknown quantity how much maintenance or how much repair often because of vandalism they're going to be exposed to but i think notwithstanding that i think we've got to be realistic and um i think sophie was in part of her remarks um parishes are not capped unless there's a change in the government policy between now and um the early bit of next year, we are capped. So we are heavily constrained as to what we can spend. So if we have an opportunity to encourage um, parishes to take on more costs, I don't think we ought to um, flinch from that. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. I'm not sure that there was a question as such, but Sophie, did you want to come back on that? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, what the only the only thing I would say is that we actually spent uh, there was quite a lot of time in the presentation spent on outlining some of the challenges of community safety. Please don't think that those challenges don't exist in other parts of the directorate. We maybe right. just draw them out as much as as um, as in that part of the presentation. Thank you, thank you. But it's it's a good point that Malcolm's making that you know we have to be careful what we're cutting, don't we? Really, yeah. Um, right. Thank you for that. Uh, Martin Alvey next, please. Thank you, Chair. And one, one for Mark. Um, area of interest to me and I was, um, is the uh, cost recovery for special services, um, which I'm pleased to hear obviously we're doing. Um, does that include, for example, a road traffic accident where invariably there's an insurer involved? I would imagine that a pile up on the A30 will, will cost many thousands of pounds to the service and so I'd be interested if there, there would be an effort to recover costs there from the uh, um, the insurer of the vehicle that was um, found culpable. Um, linked to that, I, I can potentially see that there's an element of spend to save here um, and I just seek reassurance that we've got the administrative capacity to follow up the cost recovery and it may be that an additional um, dedicated administrator may actually bring in far more money than they cost in terms of that cost recovery. Um, and finally linked to that it is I think it's a bit of a positive story um, that we should perhaps put out to the public that uh, their hard earned council tax isn't being wasted where uh, we can potentially recover the money from um, from an insurer or, or some other party. So, and, and thanks for that. That's, that's a, a very good presentation uh, across the board. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Alvey. And uh, specifically picking up on the special service call with regard to attendance at road traffic collisions. Some of the activities the Fire and Rescue Service do are, is statutory duty as a result of the National Framework document. So we are sort of legislatively to uh, undertake those duties and attending road traffic collisions is one of those. But um, certainly what you've alluded to, and I guess there is something for us to bring forward in, in the future in terms of risk, is some of the other activities such as maybe pumping out a fishing boat um, there might be environmental uh, implications to that but that might be rechargeable 
Uh, rescuing animals is, is not a statutory duty, although there might be a life risk associated with it. So again, that is something that we consider, but it is a piece of work that we're doing. We're analysing our incident data and analysing potentially what incidents could be cost recovered, but certainly sort of working with legal. So we are testing some of those and there will be sort of an appetite of risk. And I would suggest that would be something that we would like to work with councillors in the future. Thank you. Can, can, I, can I just come back briefly? Yeah, briefly. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank, thanks for that, Mike. And, and, and actually, one of the reasons I I singled out RTCs, and I, obviously I appreciate your attendance, is is statutory. The NHS will send you a bill, um, and clearly the NHS is also um, have has statutory obligations, um, and and that's why I, I'm wondering if there's an anomaly there between the NHS's ability to to bill people as a result of RTCs and the fire services inability to do so and whether that's so I know it's a, yeah. a political um, issue but uh, I wonder if you had a thought on that. No, I understand it is sort of due to um, sort of the legislation around it, but um, certainly I will go away and just uh, seek that actual clarity on you around what is the difference between a fire and rescue service attendance and that of our med um, medical response colleagues. So I will come back to you on that one. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I think to all of us, really, rather than just individually to Martin, that would be really helpful. Um, yes, um, Leanne is just is just reminding us that we're not supposed to be chatting in the chat box. Um, I don't think Cornelius was was here when we when we were talking about that earlier on. Um, the chat box is F O I able, so we have to be careful what we say in there. Um, so just, I mean, I do it as well. I keep forgetting. Um, right, next person is Dominic Fairman, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so um, I welcome this approach to the budget um, and I welcome the fact that we're being asked initially to look strategically. So my first three points are about the sort of strategic areas. So not in the slides, but in the report, there is on page 224 a transfer to the General Reserve of 1.92 million. Um, that strikes me as a bit bizarre in a pandemic year that we would be transferring money to reserve rather than from it. So perhaps I could get some narrative around that. Then when we go to the spend map, which I think is, is very useful. Um, now my, um, my perception is that we invested quite heavily in the rural road network over the last few years, and especially with a view to improving the drainage. So the water didn't sit on the roads and um, affect um, the potholing quite so bad. So. And my, my impression, especially in my rural areas, is, is the roads are pretty good. Uh, we've done a good job with that investment. So I'm wondering then whether there's an opportunity, uh, dare I say it, to sort of sweat the asset of our rural uh, highways network um, while we struggle to make the box balance for the next couple of years and, and cash in a bit on the, on the maintenance work we've done. And then lastly, strategically, I notice on the spend map we got £4.9 million on coastline management. Now there's no details in the neighbourhood thing like that, So, but we do sit on the Flood and Coastal Committee, so I'm, I, I don't have any clue what that's about or, or which committee that sits with if it isn't us. So I would like some more information about that, please. So if I could take those first three points, then I can go on to the neighbourhood points afterwards. If that's okay, Chair. Yes, could I ask Ellie if you're still, I hope you're still there, could, do, we, do you want to take the first couple of the, the, the first points? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I will do. So in the um, table that you're referring to, there is a, a budget to transfer to the general fund reserve. So these are, um, these are amounts that um, as part of the budget setting process last year or the year before, um, we removed the contingency budget from um, for, from the um, from the kind of corporate items, so from the corporate area of the um, the the council's budget, and this was an amount that we were looking to um, to we put into the general fund. So there's an amount that's been kind of budgeted to be transferred into the general fund that gave us um, an amount of money if we needed to to draw down for contingency, because there is no contingency budget within the council's accounts now. Over, you know, over the past three or four years, it's gone from from ten million pounds down to to now it being a budgeted transfer into the general fund. 
but it's one of those one of those things that um, will need to be explored as part of these kind of like these technical accounting um, items that Sophie mentioned at the beginning of the um, beginning of the presentation. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Sally. Um, in terms of the, the coastal um, spend, I think um, I think at least one, uh, nearly 1.2 million of that is on the RNLI contract alone. Uh, we've also got beach cleansing and various other repairing coastal assets. So where a footpath has um, crumbled and we've got a landslide or something, and we have to, um, that that's a, a revenue spend in year. It's not a capital spend. So so I think that would probably account for those. Um, and then in terms of the roads network, that's probably one for for Phil Mason. Um, but um, but I, I I suspect that he might say that um, that it would cost us more in the in the in the long run if we if we don't spend the, the the money we do. But I would agree with you. I think we have excellent roads in Cornwall, um, and you only have to travel up country. Not that any of us do anymore. To uh, to be very proud of the roads we've got here. Can I just, like, I can just provide a little bit more context on the road one. Um, so some of the roads fund, we, some of the roads funding is is capital as well. So we just um, not all of it is the revenue maintenance budget. So um, it's just being we'll have to be mindful of um, of that kind of that capital revenue split um, in 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 giving you the ability to kind of move that money around. OK, thank you. Um, thanks for the, um, the bit of narrative around the coastline. So my concern with the coastline is that we come the, as the council, we become the sort of first port of call for um, matters of erosion of assets that aren't always ours. Um, so there's the perception that the, the council will come in and sort stuff out. Um, you know, global warming and our, you know the challenges of our coastline uh, are only going to get worse and we really need to um, be realistic with the public about what we can and can't do on that site. Uh, so when it comes to the neighbourhood specific stuff, uh, slide 16, the fire demand. Um, how realistic is that given that a lot of the work now you do is around storms, flooding and wildfires. Uh, we're entering our first named storm this weekend. Uh, the hurricane season in America is intensified, which obviously knocks on to us weeks, you know, several weeks down the line. Um, I'm wondering if we're really um, addressing the climate change challenge. Um, the drug and alcohol service, you know, we put them down as a demand led service and yet they um, further, you know, they're actually, they're a prevention service. Um, so I wonder if they sit, you know, well within the demand. As, you know, it, it's, it's an invest to save very often. And, you know, that was quite a sobering um, presentation that Simon gave us. And I do have a proposal, you know, um, and it particularly um, appertains to the work we've done around HWRC. So I hope you'll bear with me for just a second because it will come out as a recommendation of mine. Um, all my um, fellow councillors are on the waste in HWRC inquiry are in the room. So it was a long time ago when we started that inquiry and we visited the site in Ivory Bridge in Devon and initially um, our recommendation at the time was to drop the current paper permit scheme for Cornwall and introduce a more uh, robust vehicle policy that we saw working in Devon. Um, and then during the over a year when the, the while the inquiry was suspended in order for negotiations to, to take place with the contractor, um, it was considered by officers that perhaps APNR, you know, a vehicle number plate recognition was the way to go as an investor save. And I felt we all felt that the digital way forward was a good thing. And if we could afford it, we should embrace it. And now, and I apologise, because I think I've been asleep at the wheel. Once we got to the recommendations to cabinet, it almost looks like that now we can't afford the vehicle number plate recognition. We might fall back on the permit scheme. Um, now, the evidence we took was that the permit scheme cost one full time employee to administer. So I would make a, a recommendation I'll read out in a minute that we go back to our original uh, thoughts about the vehicle policy, that we save the full time employee on the um, paper permit scheme for the HWRCs and then perhaps and 
we put that money uh, towards funding one antisocial behaviour case worker. Um, my frustration with the public health side of it is that two committees look at it, there's a bit of duplication going on there, um, that we usually just passport the money we get from central government, um, and yet we know the value of these uh, of these prevention services. So um, I will be making a recommendation that we uh, recommend that the permit scheme for the HWRCs is dropped in line with evidence taken at the committee's inquiry in favour of a more robust digital policy, saving one FTE post which could be used to fund one additional antisocial behaviour caseworker. Um, so I'd welcome first officer's views and then perhaps support from members of the committee. Could I ask Pete to come in first um, on, on that if that's right? Yeah, more, more than happy to. I think um, in terms of the permit role, um, Dominic, it's it's not a full time um, position that, that that particular role. So it's probably uh, as much as or, or probably lower than half. But certainly, certainly uh, there, there is some resource that goes into to that. I think the, 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 the challenge we had was the operational costs were far more than we could identify as being a potential saving. But I think there is scope for me to have more conversations with with Suez and the recommendation left it to the next administration to 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 approve in conjunction with the portfolio holder, the service director and the section 151 when a business case can be made to do it. So my ambition is to is still to do AMPR as as was the committee's view. Um, but I really need to drive down the cost and create a business case that that effectively demonstrates that the commercial waste we chase out will be sufficient to, to, to cover the additional revenue costs. So at the minute, if we were to go with a recommendation right now, um, I think we would find ourselves needing to find more revenue than we would actually save right at this point in time. So my ambition remains aligned with, with that <laughs> recommendation, but I think if we were to press on with it now, we would we would find ourselves absolutely with a with a revenue cost over and above what our what we've got budgeted for. Um, so, hence the recommendation. Sorry if that was wasn't wasn't clear at the at the time, Dominic. And I do share your ambition, but just don't think that we can do it the way you're suggesting right now. And can I ask? Uh, do, do you want do you want to come back on that, or shall I ask um, Mark to respond to your other point? Uh, so just to say that the I, I didn't realise it was a part time post. I'm sure that we were told it was a full time equivalent um, at the time, um, and um, that's a shame because um, obviously we wanted to be more robust about the limiting of the black bag waste at the time, uh, which would have mitigated that uh, additional revenue cost perhaps. Um, so that's a bit of a shame, really. But I, I still my frustration always remains that we passport the public health money, um, which um, sits with Haskos at the moment. Um, and we, we, you know, we should be putting our hands in our pockets where we can um, to mitigate, you know, the loss of some of these valuable services in, in prevention on drug and alcohol and sexual abuse and the, and the like. And I'm sure you'll, the committee will want to make some recommendations when we come to the January meeting on that. So maybe we could use the intervening time to work through how that might look. Um, Mark, there was a point um, that uh, Councillor Fairman raised around uh, the demand uh, for fire. Yeah, th thanks Sophie and, and thanks Councillor Fairman. I think if I can um, draw you to uh, which was slide 16 in, in the presentation whereby there was a graph shows the forward profile in terms of the revenue. So certainly in the um, four years from this point to 23, 24, we have actually sort of built in a growth of uh, approximately 900,000, which is based on um, our forward, our backward look in terms of our response and sort of planning going forward. So taking that into account, so certainly my presentation, the caveat was very much around, you know, if we do experience those widespread uh, weather events that uh, we are factoring it in. So we have worked very much with finance to profile that forward look. So. Hopefully that answers your, uh, your your point. Thank you. Yeah, so my point comes about because, you know, you've been very open and honest and transparent in the graph and uh, it, you know, is plain for everybody to see that the fire actuals forecast orange bar pokes above the forecast 
uh, for the last two years and yet neatly stays below for the next term. So it, it, just, it, it seems to be almost an area highlighting itself that that's a very conservative growth estimate that you've got there. Yeah, absolutely. And just to provide some clarity on that, where we've gone over in the past two years are actual overspends. Some of, you, some of that is attributable to our income targets that we've not met, so it's reprofiling of the budget. And also some of our structure review. So we are going through two projects at the moment to review our structure and our posts within the organisation. So we are forecast to align next year. Thank so you. that difference you see is a pressure going forward because what we're saying is we're not expecting, so we need to reprofile that budget so that we don't yeah. have that unrealistic income target. That's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, Mike Thomas next, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think the uh, the comments by Councillor Brown and Councillor Fairman really sort of accentuate what uh, members of this committee feel about the importance of um, the, the officers working with antisocial behaviour. Uh, and prevention. And I really do feel that that is, is something that needs to be protected as part, part of the budget as much as possible. And uh, I realise that is a demand, that pressure may even grow. And it's not just those who perpetrate these, these, these issues, it's the huge support that officers can give to the victims of antisocial behaviour. And, and that's, I think, what residents uh, need to be made aware. Those who don't necessarily uh, are, are fortunate not to become uh, involved in such incidents, but in fact, the, the support is really going out to help residents who are experiencing some very unpleasant uh, issues, which as, as Chair, you are aware of from our own experiences uh, locally. Um, and if a final point or a question really, the issue about de devolution, it's going to be a case surely that some parishes are just not able to take things on, that they have tried, they've looked, but they just do not have the resources or the capacity, unless of course they were to regroup and uh, to form themselves into districts, maybe, as mini district councils. What an idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm, talking about, idea Pens Mike, I'm talking about Penzance, Mike. Don't make any excuses for them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I'm not talking Sophie, about did you, did you want to come back on that, my love? I'm, I'm not, was there a precise question in there? I don't, I don't think so. I think it was I'm more comments sure to support. That, yeah. Uh, um, yes, yeah, there was a question. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mike. It was really how far is it possible to actually pursue devolution with with smaller parishes? I'm not talking about towns. I'm talking mm -hmm. about the, the, the smaller parishes that just do not have the capacity. Obviously, yeah. towns like Penzance have the capacity, and that's a political issue, which the member there is, is raising in a, in a public forum. But that it, it's the smaller parishes that just do not have the capacity. Surely there's a point where you just have to accept it ain't going to happen. Mm -hmm. and, and that will be reflected in the assets that are available in the area and, um, and, and whether there's any income generating opportunities that go with them. I mean, I don't know if Pete might want to add stuff or something here, but, but we're, you know, the, the whole devolution programme has been a collaborative piece of work with parish and town councils to um, encourage them where they're able to to take on the things that matter to them and um, and in some cases in many cases I accept there is a, um, a a kind of a critical mass but in many cases they are able to to raise some preset or as we heard in the example of Goran Haven to actually find some quite imaginative ways of, of raising money not through um, through local taxpayers as well but Pete did you want to add anything there about the sort of critical mass element no, I, I, I think I, I think it's a, it's it's a it's a valid point, um, but there's, the, the, there is absolutely a a better way of doing many of these things if they're done locally with local cleaners, with local expertise, with local pride. Um, the, the, there is a different way, and it's I think we we're keen to explore that. We're keen to to put some to put some of these assets in order before they're handed over as well. A, a, a position. Of, of late that we've been able to do and so we'd welcome to having the dialogue but but we we do recognize not everywhere has got the ambition or has got the resources in terms of they've got a part-time clerk and and that is challenging but it, we're always keen to have the conversation where we can and if there is a desire locally to do something different and better then we're very happy to have the conversation um along the way yeah, and I think the other point that, you know, members had a lot of foresight when they also put some capital budget to the side for us to be able to actually, where we are handing assets over, make sure that they're in good condition, 
um, and the, or there's a dowry to go with them. So that in, in some cases that has really helped the discussions. Thank you, Chair. Thank Thanks you. for raising it though, Mike. Thank you. Um, and Steve Knightley, please. Oh, hi. I, well, I was actually, uh, Dominic was making a proposal. I was going to second it, but I, I'm not sure now if he's withdrawing his proposal, is he? We'll we'll get no we'll go through that now then if if uh, if you just hang hang fire there and then we'll come yeah. to you see yeah okay that'd be lovely um, that's all the people I've got that wanted to speak so we do now move to the recommendations but they're not the recommendations that's printed in our report they've been revised which I think is really helpful um, to the ones that are on the slide in front of us that's being shared at the moment by Tracy um, and I guess that the the officers take note of the comments made by the committee in developing the budget which is the second one that will um, hopefully take on board a lot of what, of what we've been saying um, but Dominic does want to come in I, I, um, we'll bring you in a minute my love to see what it is that you wanted to add to it yeah, OK, uh, thanks, Chair. So I, um, I'm going to persist with a proposal um, and, and there it is. It's, um, it, it reflects what I've heard from the officers, I hope, and reflects some of the things the committee have been saying during the thing. So um, do you want me to read it out or do you want Joe to read it out? Or? Hopefully you can see it all anyway. I can read it out, Chairman, if you want me to. So um, the proposal by Councillor Fairman is um, that the recommendations would be one, that the current approved council business plan 2018 to 22, which continues our commitment to the strategic priorities for Cornwall, is updated with relevant data and statistics for the next financial year 2021 stroke 22. And that the updated council business plan forms the basis for the public consultation on the 2021 stroke 22 budget launched on 18th September 2020. Number two, that officers take note of the comments made by the committee in developing the budget. Number three, the committee expresses concerns that the savings required will inevitably adversely affect delivery of frontline services. And number four, that the committee recommend that officers explore the, the ending of the permit scheme for household waste recycling centres in line with evidence taken in the committee's inquiry in favour of a more robust vehicles policy with any identified savings being used to fund additional antisocial behaviour work case worker hours. So that's what Councillor Fairman has proposed. Back to you, Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, that's Dominic has has, um, has proposed that and uh, Steve Knightley are you still happy to second those? Yes I am. I'm still wondering why you weren't answering me it's because my microphone wasn't on. Thank you for that. Um, right are there any other amendments or recommendations? Um, Pete Marsh wants to speak a minute. Just, just uh, I, I would just caution I mean I, I, I get that the, absolutely the committee is free to make any recommendations it, it wishes to but I, I, I would just point out that I don't believe that there are any savings and I recognise likewise it's worded in such a way as to say with any identified savings being used but I, I think I, I've got a duty to say that I, I do not believe that it will create savings in fact I think this recommendation would, would, would create cost over and above the existing budget but I, I do recognise it's it's free for the committee to, 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 to endorse this if they wish, but professionally I've got to say that I don't see there being any savings at all and, and quite the opposite, I'm afraid. Thank you. I, I think that, that Dominic has covered it just to, you know, he's, he's saying that you you explore it and come back to us with with a, with, a, with, a, with a, you know, to say, no, it won't save any money, it's going to cost money, then you can tell us that the next meeting at the January meeting. So I think, you know, that that's uh, probably what he's meaning there. Uh, Martin Alvey, have you got a, um, an amendment to this, please? Um, only to say that uh, I'm really Pete, uh, Peter has has just said it all and, and, and his comments earlier on. Um, this is something for the next administration to um, resolve. Um, as that stands, I, I will not be voting for it. I will be quite happy to, to vote for um, Dominic's amended uh, recommendations without um, bullet four there. Um, right. So I, I don't know what the process is, whether I, I put in a, a, a an amendment or we go to the vote on that and then I put in the amendment but uh, that, that's my position. 
I would I would suggest that you put an amendment to say that you you do, that we just do one, two, and three, and not four. Is that right, Joe? Yes, it is, Chairman. So yeah. so the recommendations one to four um, that I that I read out is the proposal that's on the table. Yeah, so at the, mo the, at the moment, if there isn't an if there isn't an amendment made to it, you would need to vote to what's on the table. So if Councillor Alfie wishes to take out um, recommendation four and just leave recommendations one to three, he would need to propose that. He would need a seconder and then we would vote on that in the first instance. Yeah, OK, that's what I thought. Right, so bear, bear with me, me a minute. And Martin, did you want to make that an amendment, darling? So yes, I'd like to make an amendment okay. that uh, it's just one to three of okay. what's on the screen. Right now, I've I've got uh, Dominic. You bear with me one second. Um, Cornelius and Fred. So Cornelius, would you like to come in first, please? Do you want to second it, or have you got a comment to make on the amendment? Well, I I was certainly. Gonna, I mean, if there's one thing worse than doing uh, sort of recommendation amendments in face to face, it's doing them in a teams meeting. I w I would say, but the I, it was simply on point three. I mean, I'm happy to support what Dominic is trying to do in, in Para 4. I just, I just wondered if he was ready to strengthen um, 3 by saying, I mean, we've got the committee expressed concerns that the savings required will inevitably adversely affect delivery of frontline services and generate additional costs in the wider system. Would he consider introducing that or would that, is that going to complicate things? Oh, bloody hell. Oh, it looks like he's wizard. doing as, as we speak. <laughs> that. Yeah. Um, well, it's simply, like, it's simply yeah. I, I'm not making this up out of my own head, Karen, because no. you, if you, the, the figures that were given by Simon Mould earlier about one pound, you know, spent in yeah. particular areas, drug and alcohol saves X amount further down the line. I think that's a point worth reiterating. Yeah. 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 Um, but okay. I'm, I'm uh, but if Dominic's willing to do that. Yeah, he's just put it in. Yeah. Um, he's, right. He's, 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 yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, you. Cornelius. Um, I've got Fred next, please, and also Pauline Giles has come in and said she'll second Martin's uh, amendment, which is just the one, two, and three. So, Fred, can I bring you in, please? Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I totally agree with Martin's sentiments, and I know that Pauline has seconded now, but I would have been quite happy to second. Okay, my love. Thank if you. If I could ask, if I could ask through you, uh, Chairman. Uh, how uh, Matt Luke would see this because he lives near a, a, a site and I, I think it's chaos enough as it stands now without introducing more and more change and I can see Pete's uh, points very clearly so yeah, yeah. I won't be supporting for anyway. Okay my darling thank you very much for that right so Pauline did you want to speak or just just that you're, you're one that you're okay to second Martin's amendment? No, I'm quite happy with uh, with just taking four eight. Everything else is is okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Matt Luke. You want to speak before we go to the vote? Yeah. Um, I know I was on the, the committee with Dominic, and you know, a lot of things we wish for didn't come to fruition in the end. But hey, that's life. <laughs> but um, it has been chaos uh, during lockdown with the, the site next to me uh, for one reason or another the, the different things on number plates on different days hasn't necessarily worked out because the public you know haven't been paying attention to what's going on um, and there's been massive queues and there's still queues there every day now um, so I, you know it is working um, but it is really 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 busy um, mm. So I, I, I can't honestly say whether getting rid of the paper, paper system and bringing in the vehicle system will make a difference after what I've seen in the last six months or not. I, I got to be honest, for once in my life, I am going to sit on the fence on this one and go, I really don't know which is a better system. And I'm sorry about that, Dominic, but having having it on my doorstep, I, I, I really don't know. I, it's, it is a swings and roundabouts thing. Um, and as to the, you know, whether we save money or not, I don't know. And to get any information out of Suez um, on costs and stuff like that, it's like, you know, it's, it's trying to get, you know, blood out of a stone. Blood out, blood out of a stone. <laughs> And I'll leave, I'll leave right. it for that. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for that insight. Okay. Right, I think we're ready to move to the vote. Now we have a proposal which is by Dominic, which is what's on our screen. 
um, and one to, oh sorry, Dominic, did you want to come back? Yeah, just for the benefit of people who, who weren't on the um, inquiry, um, I'm not proposing a free for all. I'm not proposing just ripping up the permit system, doing nothing else. We went to Ivy Breach, we looked at what worked there. It, it puts, the, you know, we already have a vehicle policy. It just means a more robust vehicle policy. So people already have to look online to discover whether their trailer is too long, too short, or whether it can be pulled by a four by four or not. Um, and it puts the onus on the, um, which is already there, you know, the, 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 the men and women who work on site already have to have a grip of the policy. And if it's a more robust policy, we can just do away with a thing where people have to apply online and then somebody has to um, physically put something in a piece of paper in an envelope. And I will beg to say that Peter actually said the other day that he forgot his pass when he went to the HWRC and they let him in anyway. So and there's anecdotal evidence from the top. Right. Um, so I'm, not, I'm not proposing a free for all. No. This is something that works in Devon and yeah. we took evidence on. OK, love, thank you very much. Um, and I think actually you're, you're, you're leaving a gap there so that you're not saying you're bringing it in. You're just asking them to explore and come back with the information, aren't you? Uh, right. So we're uh, ready uh, to go. Ca Car that. Carolyn, I'm sorry. really sorry to butt in. Who's that? I'm, I'm Pauline, trouble, sorry. Yeah, I'm having trouble with my system here. I'm really sorry about that. But I just wondered in, in, in point three, Dominic has, put, Dominic has put the word unintentional. I wonder if he meant additional. That was all. Yes, he probably did. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry to cut in. No, 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 that's, that's, what that's, what that's what it's That's what it's all about. That's great. Thank you. Nothing's going wrong in Pendine. Again. Oh, that's sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's fine. It's all, we can hear you and that's, that's great. Right, so we're now ready to go to the vote. So I'm going to hand across to Joe in a moment. What we're voting on is the, the proposal is what's on the screen in front of you, which is proposed by Dominic and seconded by Steve Knightley. And there's an amendment and we will vote on the amendment first. And the amendment is proposed by Martin, Martin Alvey and seconded by Pauline Giles. And that is to be just one, two and three that's on the page there, leaving off item the number four. So can we go to Joe to take the, the roll call for the amendment first, please? Chairman, there's one thing we just need to clarify is that when um, Councillor Alvey and Councillor Giles put forward the amendment, it was before Councillor Fairman ah, right. changed yes. the words on recommendation three. So we just need to check oh, yeah. that Councillor Alvey, yeah. Alvey and yeah. Giles are happy with those change of words on number three. Sorry, darling, I'd forgotten that. Martin Alvey, are you happy with the change of words on, on number three? Yes, perfectly happy with that. Thank you. And Pauline, are you happy with them on number three? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Lovely. Um, so if we go back to you again, Joe, please, if you could take the vote for the amendment first, please. Yes. So for the sake of the live stream, I'm just going to read out how recommendation three was changed. So the re so recommendation three now says the committee expresses concerns that the savings required will inevitably adversely affect delivery of frontline services and potentially generate additional cost in future years. I previously read out recommendation one and two, so we're voting on recommendation three that's slightly changed and it's recommendation one, two and three without recommendation four, which is the, the amendment. So I'll just go now to the vote on the amendment, which has been proposed by Councillor Alvey and it's been seconded by Pat Councillor Giles. So, Councillor Alvey, are you, are you Thank you. Councillor Malcolm Brown? He's had to leave us, Joe. I think he's left, yes. Councillor Nikki Chopak? Or Councillor Dominic Fairman? Against. Councillor Pauline Giles? Or Fred Greenslade. Four. Councillor Steve Knightley. Um, four. Councillor Matt Luke. Can I interrupt one second? Steve, you were seconding Dominic's original thing. Yeah, so are you sure? I, I think I've got slightly confused uh, where we've got to now. Sorry to interrupt you. We're um, on the amendment, Steve. Pardon? <laughs> You, you've, you've all managed to confuse me. <laughs> it's not Sorry, difficult. Could, yeah, could you, you seconded the original proposal and we are now in the midst of taking the vote on the amendment. So uh, are you for the amendment or not? Well, I was confused because uh, Dominic just said he was against it and it was his amendment. 
No. Shall I, shall I come in, Chairman? Thank you, Joe, if you would. So, Councillor Knightley, originally yeah. Councillor Fairman proposed four recommendations. Yes. With the last, with the last one, which was being about the um, make the, the one which referred to the household waste recycling centres. And that yes. was the one you seconded. Yes. Councillor Alvey and Councillor um, has made a proposal to leave the fourth recommendation off. Ah, uh, OK. I, and that's, I'm and really that's been sorry. seconded by Councillor Giles. And the, and the process is that we always. Yeah. So what was on the table was what you and Councillor Fairman have put no. forward. Now there's been an amendment and we always deal with amendments first. So, so what we're all voting on is is actually not what you seconded. No, so no, we're voting I, on having just the first three recommendations. I, 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 I understand. And this is one of the horrible things I agree with um, Cornelius about not being in the room. Uh, I, I, I changed that to against. Sorry. OK. Councillor Luke. Um, against. OK. Councillor Cornelius Olivier. Against. Councillor Karen Rule. Against. Councillor John Simmons. Yes, sorry, uh, uh, four. Councillor Mike Thomas. Against. And Councillor Kevin Towell. Four. So. It's all getting very interesting now we're doing a virtual meeting. We have, um, Mal um, Councillor Malcolm Brown has left the meeting. So now there are 12 of you voting. We have 12 in favour. We have 12 against. So Chairman, you have the casting vote. Yeah. You know, it's six in favour and six against. Yes, sorry. <laughs> six in favour, six yeah. against. Yeah, I I voted with with the uh, with the proviso that um, Dominic has left it vague enough that the officers, because I know Pete isn't happy, that Pete that they will investigate it and come right. back to us again, which is leaving number four in. I'll maintain my vote, which is which was against before. So um, so it'll be seven against then and, and six in favour. So that means that we've got six votes in favour, seven votes against. So the men the amendment has fallen. So the amendment is not no longer taken forward. So what we're left with now is we're left with the original recommendation from Councillor Fairman, which was the four recommendations, um, seconded by Councillor Knightley. I think for the sake of the live stream, I know it's going to take time, but I think for the sake of the live stream, I ought to read it out again. Yeah. So I'll just do that a moment. And then we'll vote on what's on the table, which is the original proposal. So it's number one, it's that the current approved council business plan 2018 to 22, which continues our commitment to the strategic priorities for Cornwall, is updated with relevant data and statistics for the next financial year 2021 to 22. And that the updated council business plan forms the basis for the public consultation on the 2021 to 22 budget launched on 18th of September 2020. Number two, that officers take note of the comments made by the committee in developing the budget. Three, the committee expresses concerns that the savings required will inevitably adversely affect delivery of frontline services and potentially generate additional cost in future years. And four, the committee recommends that officers explore the ending of the permit scheme for household waste recycling centres in line with evidence taken in the committee's inquiry in favour of a more robust vehicle pol vehicles policy with any identified savings being used to fund additional antisocial behaviour caseworker hours. So those are the four recommendations now that we're voting on. So I'm just going to start again now with Councillor Alvey. Councillor Alvey, are you in favour, against or are you abstaining? Uh, I'm now against. OK, thank you. Councillor Malcolm Brown, as we said, has left the meeting. So now Councillor Nikki Chopak. Uh, against. <coughs> Excuse me, against. Councillor Dominic Fairman. Paul. Councillor Pauline Giles. Against. Councillor Fred Greenslade. Against. Councillor Steve Knightley. Four. Councillor Matt Luke. Four. 
Councillor Cornelius Olivier. Four. Councillor Carolyn Rule. Four. Councillor John Simmons. Against. Councillor Mike Thomas. Four. Councillor Kevin Towell. Against. So once again, we have six in favour and six against. So Chairman, you need to cast your casting vote, please. Oh, I hate this. Yeah, I'll do the same as I did last time and I'll stick with my original vote, which is four, to en enable the officers to investigate that, please. Thank you, Councillor Rawls. So Chairman, we now have seven votes in favour, six against. So the proposal, the motion is carried. Thank you very much, Joe, and, and uh, thank you, Dominic, for putting us in that awkward position there, or putting me in an awkward position like that, what you like at all. Um, right, uh, Mike, thank you, my love. I know you've got to leave for the um, electoral review meeting. Thank you for your time and, and your support here just now. Uh, okay. That's really good. Um, right, so that's, that's that item sorted out. Now, um, colleagues, it's now 1.30. We've still got um, the questions, uh, the update from cabinet members, which we've had tabled, and we've got questions to the cabinet members. Would you like a five minute comfort break or would you like to carry straight on? Um, can I have an indication in the box what, which you'd like to do? Please, somebody put their hand up. Um, um, if I propose that we have a five minute comfort break and then we carry on for the, that extra half an hour, um, if anybody is against that idea, can you put an X in the box? Right, nobody has. OK, so if we just have a five minute. Oh, sorry, Nikki. All oh, right, OK, Nikki, thank you for your time, my darling. Um, if we have a five minute comfort break, literally five minutes, so come back again at 13.35, that's 1.35, and then we'll do the, the last half hour, hopefully without. Is that OK for timings, um, Joe? Can you tell me for the for the Dean's thing? Um, yes, it should. Yeah. We're going to have a five minute break. Yeah. So I think I think um, Leanne will correct me as producer if I'm wrong, but I think when we get when we approach to two o'clock, um, we would need to if we do need to carry on, we would need to adjourn um, probably for about five, ten minutes because we have to our live stream producer has to take off one live stream and go on to another. Well, shall we go straight through? I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's very difficult. Like this is one one time when it isn't easy to do, is it? Can we have a hands up that we carry straight on, please? Can you can you all use your hands up function? Is everybody happy that we carry straight on rather than having a five minute break? Brilliant. That's lovely. That's what I need to see. Thank you very much, all of you. So we will carry straight on rather than having a comfort break. So um, if we move to the item eight, which is the update from the cabinet members. Um, thank you for our three cabinet members. They've all put reports in, which is brilliant. Thank you. Um, we now go to questions to those cabinet members. Um, Adam isn't with us, I'm afraid, but um, or Dominic's left as well. Um, but Adam's not here. So if we've got any questions for Adam, we will take note of them and, and get a written response for you. So um, who have we got first? Cornelius, I think, or is that just your hand up from before? Anybody got any questions for our cabinet colleagues, please? That That's historic, Chair. I'll wait till others have been. OK, sweetheart. Anybody got and anybody going to put a cross in the meeting chat box to let me know if you've got any questions for our cabinet colleagues, please? Gosh, nobody. They were very full reports, so that was great. <sighs> I don't think we have any questions for you. Um, can I thank Edwina and Rob? I know you've both sat through the meeting and been putting comments in at different times, so that's been really helpful. Um, so can I thank you very much for being here? Um, but we haven't got any questions for you, so that's brilliant. You've got away with that. That's brilliant. Um, I, think because I think the reports were very full, so that was lovely. They were they were very clear to, to read and everything. So in that case, thank you everybody very much. Um, moving on to item 10, I don't have any other business that I consider to be urgent, so um, I will declare the meeting closed. And can I thank everybody for your time and patience, please? Joe, did you want to come in? Are you all right there? No, that's fine. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you everybody for attending today.
Thank you, darling. And thanks, Edwina. She's just saying in the chat box there, if anybody thinks of any questions afterwards, as always, um, all our cabinet members are, are very happy to, to answer anything um, in between the meetings, I know. So thank you all very much for your time and have a lovely afternoon. Take care, everybody, and thank keep you. safe. Bye. 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 B